All right, hello everybody. Um, this is Training Without Conflict podcast number 14. Uh, my guest tonight is Michael Shikashio. I've been meaning to invite him to my podcast for quite some time and I'm super happy that he actually agreed to come and, and we have a conversation. For those of you that don't know him, Michael is a world-renowned aggression specialist. Um, he's certified through the Association of Animal Behavior Consultants and is one of the few um, worldwide certified aggression experts, I should say. Um, Michael speaks and makes presentations in many different conferences and universities worldwide, um, as well as all the major training conferences in the States, Mexico, and, and um, yeah, it, it's pretty impressive all the, the work that you do. Um, you also offer some, and I, I, again, I'm not quite sure if it's a um, school or if it's separate courses, which I want to get to, but uh, in collaboration with quite a few very well-known uh, in the force free community uh training um you know very very big names and working together which is super interesting um i i cannot wait to ask and talk about this as well as a very interesting podcast um the by the end of the dog which um i i recommend everybody to at least to start there and then if you guys are more interested uh after the podcast um you know you will know how to find him. Michael, what else am I missing? I think you did a good job covering quite a bit. <laughs> good. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, my specialty is on aggression. So that's what I focus on and started uh, aggressivedog.com where you can find all, all those things you were just talking about, all the courses and the, the conference and the podcast is all on there. So um, if anybody wants to learn more, it's a, the easiest way to find is aggressivedog.com. Perfect website for it. Yeah, just like I have Malina.com and yeah, yeah, it's somehow, somehow <laughs> that must have cost you a few dollars to get that, or some, either that you got it early on, right? <laughs> yes, I got it. I got it quite early on. Um, yeah, I, I was hunting a certain person, and and finally he gave in, and yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I, I, as I said, I, I'm quite familiar with what you do, but for, for everybody that's listening that doesn't know you, how did you start? And you don't need to go in crazy details, but how long and how did how did all went for you? Yeah, you know, it started probably about 20 years ago now, about a little over 20 years now, and um, kind of working with uh, rescues and fostering dogs. And that was kind of, I wasn't really into the business side of things at all. I was just kind of doing it at another career and uh, was doing a lot of fostering and working with different rescues. And anybody who's done a lot of that <laughs> knows that the uh, rescues end up sending you more and more difficult fosters if you start getting known as like the home that can deal with that and you're sustaining all of those fosters. So uh, I saw, I saw though a, a real need for the dogs that have behavior issues because most of them as you might know, get surrendered or given up on or face worse outcomes uh, because they can't, they don't have the help they need. And there's not at that time, even and still now, but even then was there was just not a lot of information about aggression. And that was something that I started to see more and more of. And I thought, what a better way to help these dogs than to learn about aggression and behavior. So I kind of jumped headfirst into that. Mm -hmm. uh, which got me into training and you know one thing led to another it was just more and more training and then like you um natural progression you start working with you know more and more clients and then you start teaching other trainers and then you keep going and you know you have a school and you know it's just it just balloons from there yes. but it's always been the focus of aggression uh and that's always been my passion is is focusing on the behavior side of things and aggression and um and i haven't really branched too far out from that honestly um uh, people ask me you oh, know you like dog sports or nose work or any of that stuff you know I, I dabble but i don't i am nowhere near that is not my um my focus at all so and that's uh, that's probably not a bad thing especially like i feel that i'm spilling myself all over the place and mm -hmm. and i'm sure you you are running out of time and i i am running out of time this is like finding time is probably one of the mm -hmm. the hardest things for me um so since you started 
did you did you actually end up keeping any of the foster dogs? Because that's kind of normally what happens. The most difficult mm. dogs end up not going <laughs> anywhere but staying with us, right? Mm. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I had a couple of them, uh, um, Dobermans. Um, you know, it's funny though. I started out in lab rescue doing a lot of uh, Labrador retrievers and you know, they, you get all kinds of mixes of labs. Of sure. course, everybody, everybody thinks it's a lab, but it's uh, something else. Uh, but, but they had, um, you know, I started getting a lot of other rescues that wanted to, uh, that started reaching out to me. So I started getting a little bit in Dobermans you know, I've always loved Dobies. So, um, yeah, had a couple of Doby fosters that ended up being mine um another little min pin pug mix of all things yes uh that my ex-wife that was my ex-wife's idea though at the time uh, and she she landed in the right home because she was um a, a terrible dog when we first got her she was about 14 weeks old when my ex-wife brought her home and the first thing first thing she did was she you know i had this yellow lab at the time sweet just think the sweetest old girl you can imagine for a yellow lab just couldn't hurt anybody but she spots my lab as soon as she gets in the home she's like huh that looks interesting so she charges over latches onto her ear and would not let go full on bite hold shake from this little 14 week old min pin pug mate. of course uh, so uh, you know clearly a lot of other homes would have been you know given given up but uh, she ended up in the right home, so we worked with her, and she ended up. She's actually still alive today. Um, she's, um, I think, close to fifteen now. That's but, the thing uh, she's, with the she's, of course, great little now. dogs. They they go forever. It's a good yeah. thing. <laughs> it's yeah, interesting because I have similar. I have, um, I had a, but it was a Yorkie, and eventually at thirteen, he died from some weird out immune disease mm. that um, you know but mm. but they were brother and sister and he was beating up on the sister and the mm. owner you know they they went to um uh animal behavior is like a certified and mm -hmm. and started it was it was just too young um like a six month old puppy and and in my opinion was a little bit too young to be put on any psychotropic medication at the time mm. um it ended up coming to me for training and I fell in love and I was like how do we convince this woman to to let me have the dog since she has already the sister and he's yeah. the bad boy so to speak you know and uh, somehow we convinced her and I ended up with him um, it's one of the dogs that I uh, it has a special place in my heart there um, yeah. so you yeah. you're in a one of the I should say like uh, you know a unique place in in the force free world and especially with the niche that you have and um, you know obviously there is there is some pressure because everybody looks up to you um, and of course we we all can be wrong sometimes but um, I think we come from a different if I don't know if we, different camps is the right word, but you know, we I'm I'm sure we're gonna find a lot of things in common, and we're gonna find things that maybe we will have different views on as we have the conversation. Um, how how do you feel with the being in that position? And and I'm sure every dog trainer, every person that does anything with dogs at some point doesn't deliver, and and like how how do you how do you go about situations like this or have you had even this yeah it's an interesting question because you know i never would have if you asked me even 10 years ago um you know I, that i'd be teaching other trainers or uh, traveling around the world doing workshops and speaking at conferences i was like i would have said no way there's that's just not me it's not what i want to be i like helping the dogs uh but then of course the realization comes to you that the best way to help more dogs is to educate more people about how to help dogs. So if you really want to reach out and, and help a lot of dogs, then teach all the people that are working with dogs as best you can, uh, especially with aggression issues. So, um, yeah, I never would have thought that it would have kind of amounted to where I'm at now. And, You're you know, it's interesting a, that, a, a, I mean, definitely you have a, a very, very unique position in, in, yeah, and it's come through several different channels. I think um, I, I, you know, I was president of the IAABC for about five years, mm -hmm. so I think that sort of helped not only my career but helped me understand sort of the politics of dog training and um, you know how to navigate conversations in a uh, in a you know 
non-confrontational way yes. <laughs> uh, in my previous career as well. So I think I've had some benefits to uh, help me where I am now in how I can educate others, but also do in a way that's uh, not creating div more divisiveness, because I'm, I'm sure you agree we see plenty of that in our industry. So I, I wanted to really focus on let's let's try not to have that divisiveness. I mean, it's a, it's a small enough community as it is. Uh, that we don't need all this fighting with each yeah. other as we especially now we're seeing it so so much with social media uh but it, i think being in a position also comes with responsibilities right and one of the responsibilities i took on is to say how can i how can i build more bridges rather than tear them down uh, in this industry and i think that's very important um so I actually don't i actually you know people put me into certain camps you know believe it or not people actually think i'm a balance trainer sometimes mm. uh, you know i don't but i actually don't put myself into either camp i never if somebody says, you know, what kind of trainer are you? I never actually describe myself as force free or balanced. I just say, I'm a trainer. I'm a dog trainer. And uh, I think that's uh, helpful to, you know, bridge some of that divide because you get, as you know, <laughs> Ivan, I'm sure, you know, you see these extremes on either, either end, right, of either camp right. or even in the middle. Sometimes you see these extremes that are very damaging to our industry. So, yeah. Um, it's a good yeah, point. interesting question. Good philosophical question to start the conversation. Good point right? with, um like um i wish i wish this is not the way it is with with the that very strong divide mm -hmm. between us um and and there is i don't know if it's similar to just everyday politics in the world but um sometimes i feel that you know we we get flooded with the two extremes and most people in the middle yeah. actually are perfectly okay to be in the middle, but um, the the very strong opinions on the two sides are trying to pull everybody not to stay in the middle. Which I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Though that's uh, that's just my opinion to it. Um, I I believe that we should be able to talk like just like how we are talking right now. I know we will disagree on things, and that's totally okay. And I think yeah. we, yeah. as long as we like what I hope that I get out of this conversation and, and my audience and hopefully people that listen to you is to hear each other different points of views and, and not necessarily agree, but just understand what's the other people um, view on certain things. And I think it's uh, the right thing to do. And for some reason, it's very hard to to for us to come together and have this kind of conversation or even um like i don't i don't know like i'm sure we like i've had i had uh simon gabois i had i've had some people but i never really wanted to ask difficult questions simply because i i in some ways i really like the conversations and i want us to keep going and and you know like for example if we end up banning electric color then we ban electric color do i agree with it i i have my opinion i wouldn't agree we can break this down but but for us not to talk about these important issues directly with each other and like yeah. like really discussing and and not not fighting very respectful conversations and going the roundabouts um it just doesn't make sense. Everybody, like I think, we get so uptight and and um, the yeah, it's it's just like extreme extreme views uh, in anything. Them are not productive and um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, extremism is is kind of never a good thing really i mean and we see it and i think you you made a good point there about how you have you know again if we were to just create like this line where you know you have one side that's very focused on one type of training method the other side's completely against that right and you have those extremes they are trying to pull from the middle and the reason why i see it is because they need backup they need somebody to to sort of um continue arguing their message for them um, and to agree with them or to like their posts or to share their their comments and things like that. And unfortunately, a lot of times those people get a lot of attention because what they're saying is, you know, it, 
it brings out emotions in people and it brings out lots of comments and, you know, shares and people start talking about it. So it becomes news in our industry, in our little industry here. And, uh, and that's unfortunate because that's what gets people's attention. It's like the argument of the week. Mm-hmm. And then it happens on either extreme. I see it happen, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's balanced or force free trainers, um, either doing it to each other <laughs> or doing it to the other, um, you, you know, the other end of the, the extreme. And it's, uh, that's unfortunate because, Really, when you look at the vast majority of trainers, they are actually kind of somewhere in that middle area. They don't want to actually fight. They just want to have, they just want to go out and train dogs. They want to have a good time. They want to have good conversations. Yes. They don't want to jump into this extremism. Yes. And if we put everybody, including the, the extreme sides, I think we mm-hmm. all try to do the best we think we are doing for the dogs. Like I have no doubts in my mind that no, no matter on which extreme side and, and who is in the middle. I think most of the people have the, the heart in the right place, so to speak. Um, there is certain people that, you know, it's clearly marketing and, and money above yeah, anything yeah. else. But that's, that's just human nature. That's normal. But I think all of us are really, yeah. the, the majority of dog trainers are really here for the right, reasons trying to trying to help dogs and at the same time learn to be better doing it um and that that's where the conversation absolutely i mean and you'll you don't see i mean the extremes again are uh, i think you're right i mean nobody gets in this at least in the right mind saying you know i want to go and hurt dogs i mean it's terrible all around and it's a terrible business model but it's also obviously questionable from um you know ethics standpoint and and all the other things that we can think about when it comes to harming animals but nobody jumps into it for that and that unfortunately sometimes people will jump onto that this evil person or this person's doing these awful things to animals when they see a particular tool or technique or something like that but nobody starts out that they they're just meaning well for the animals you know including myself you know i was uh, i I guess you would consider if you were to label it a crossover trainer you know so i started out prong collars e collars choke Mm -hmm. chains Mm -hmm. uh, when i first started out and i wasn't jumping in saying i want to jump in and hurt all these foster dogs right (laughs) and it's just uh it's sad that um you know sometimes that's that accusations there uh because it's really not the case. I mean, there are, of course, those extreme examples of somebody that is abusing animals, or but that's so far and few between, you know, on, on either side. You can see, uh, you know, trainers in certain methods hoarding animals or doing awful things in the name of, you know, and not using any of those tools, but they're doing other really terrible things from a quality of life standpoint. Yeah, very so, true. Yeah. It's yeah. a hmm, good, good points. Um, I, yeah, the the crossover trainer that's a i think it's also one of the typical things again on both sides um uh, trainers will say well yeah i used to be force free i used to be all positive but it didn't work out for me i needed to have results Mm -hmm. and i went this way and the other way around uh my opinion my take on this is that i have no doubt that i I, I've been training dogs for, for more than 40 years. Um, I know you, I know one of your people you look up to and you learn from was uh, Trish King. I, I was at a time in, um, that was way before Jane Donaldson came to the San Francisco mm-hmm. SPCA, but I, I, I worked there for about five years. And it was very exciting time. This was like, early 90s and she was inviting in Napa all these trainers from from UK and from like I I mean we somehow got exposed to to everything that was coming up that whole wave of of you know like it was just super super interesting and motivating for everybody um where I'm going with this though is the um I kind of sidetracked like like when we say that it's a I'm crossover trainer, I somehow believe that it's unfair to say that something altogether as a package is not working. And that probably we're just learning from not the right person or learning 
very specific approach that that doesn't expand and doesn't lead to to more opportunities and options and we don't understand them and i'm not talking uh, i i'm very sincerely talking about uh every side of this uh position mm -hmm. um because I don't know, like I don't know how much you actually know about me and if you've seen any, but um, I mean, I, I'm very good at shaping. I'm extremely good at um, a lot of different kind of dog training. And I, I would say that I am very familiar and I stay up to date probably more than most APDT members combined like the, the member community like i that's all i do i'm interested in dog training and and i'm interested in all sides of dog training because ultimately i want to know that if i'm failing and i'm doing everything i can is there something else that i can do and and then yeah. cost and benefit of course and welfare where we draw the lines um, but that's that's just how I, I think of when we talk about uh, the crossover trainers. Like, uh, um, I mean, interesting. Like, so when you when you started, you you basically went the traditional route, like most people, and and eventually, mm -hmm. you you found the 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 force free. And I mean, it was twenty years ago. Yeah, it was all still kind of the the. It was probably a little bit earlier the the big wave when when it was just yeah. it, we yeah. went all crazy. I mean, me included. I mean, seriously, <laughs> we were like, "Wow, this is just this is it," you know. And but I will tell you, like for for me in specifically, um, there was there was a point where it's like, okay, can we do everything one way? Yes, we can, most of the time. As far as how much effort and time is spent, it also should be taken under consideration. And I'm not, um, um, and for some reason, and I don't know how this happened, but we started to divide more and more and more. Instead of, mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is all very good stuff. How can yeah. we all incorporate the best of all sides and make the ultimate training, understanding training? Um, and I don't think this is happening anytime soon, if ever, which is super sad. Like I'm honestly very sad that this is where we are and and just because everybody is even afraid to talk about it and yes there are difficult questions yeah. there are difficult conversations <clears throat> but if we don't have them we we stay in our bubble and that bubble yeah. can expand and expand but we still stay in that bubble yeah. um yeah like I, I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's lots of good points you make because, you know, I agree. I mean, it's, it's sad what's happening now. I think, you know, fast forward to today, it's because of social media and just how fast information spreads and how fast conversations spread too. rumors, accusations, arguments, conflicts spread very quickly in, in our world now. I mean, yeah, oh. overnight. I mean, it's hard to keep up sometimes, right? And uh, versus, you know, you're going back 20, 40 years ago, you know, you in sort of in the, uh, it's interesting you talk about California too, because it is kind of the Silicon Valley 100%. of the dog training world. When you think about uh, San Francisco, Marin, um, and all those areas where it was really amazing at the time. I'm sure I wish I could go back that and, and experience that because there's so many good trainers came out of that area. And uh, it's, there's so, so much happening. I mean, so many uh, advances in just the dog training terminology and techniques came out of that area of the country. So, so and it's still a very special area. There's still lots of talent 
uh, in that location. But yeah, it's, it's definitely think about the old days, you know, you would, you would transfer information. You'd have to read a book. You'd actually have to sit down and digest hundred pages, 200 pages of a book and not go on social media and see, you think, you know, it all after watching 10 Instagram yes. videos, right. <laughs> or somebody's TikTok videos, you get these trainers. Now they're getting most of their education from quick little 30 second, one minute video clips, and they're never getting the full picture. And included in that is all of the politics and the messaging of the politics. And uh, trainers actually building their whole brand from the politics of it. And that's unfortunate, you know, and that's, but that's the, how the algorithms work. That's how the culture works right now. They're surrounded, they're, they're creating their own unique cultures that are bolstered by likes and shares and all of the follows that continues to reinforce them. So they get the positive reinforcement from their own messaging. So they think their messaging is beneficial, working, truthful, powerful. And the only thing that it really is, is the powerful aspect in the sense is it's, it's really tearing down bridges, um, especially in the younger generation, right? We see it in the you know, much younger trainers coming up. Maybe they've been training two or three years. They jump into the politics of it. And so you see this, this dichotomy of, of, you know, this, the shifts, just the further divide happening because they, they just want to keep winning their arguments as, you know, yes. as one yes. would do as a 20 or 20 year old, as I've been there before too. Uh, but now, unfortunately we don't know, they don't, they're not jumping into the books. They're not uh, putting in critical thought into what they're saying. You know, at least we had, even back then, we've got things like Yahoo, oh, groups, Yahoo groups, if you remember that. Priceless. And, yeah, oh there's God. a little bit more discussion versus, you know, quick comments. At least you had to put a paragraph yes, together true. back then. Now it's just like, you can, you're limited I to 40 characters. I wonder if those Yahoo groups or, are still, you know? they, they have to be still existing. I don't think anything goes away. They're really? gone. I wish I, I would actually have a good time going back to look at my old comments right. and archives, you know, to see what I would said 20 years ago. I probably would die. I think a lot of people would die laughing if they read what I wrote 20 years ago. But that's how it is. You grow, you, you change. Yeah, those, yes. those were the good days. Wow, <laughs> the wow you took me away. Yes, very in interesting because this, I, <laughs> I bet you those are, they have to be like nothing goes away once it's on the Internet. It doesn't. Yeah, they yeah. archived them. I think they archived them, but they gave everybody a chance to archive them. But um, I don't think you can actually mm. access any of the old mm. messages anymore. They kind of, you know, as Yahoo true, also true, true, declined. True, I think true. they dumped all of it. So, so, so tell yeah. me yeah. with um, yeah. I have so many questions that it's it's very hard to even pick where to start. <laughs> like, you you obviously found that you're successful without the use of aversive to a great extent since and, and I am actually speculating here I'm not sure if you completely have abandoned the use of aversives or or that's still a possibility at some point mm -hmm. yeah so it d depends how you define aversives I think that uh, you know so if we're talking about all aversives, no. I mean, that's impossible to do, right? Um, and so we have to be realistic about, yeah, aversives are not only naturally occurring, but also something a trainer might incorporate, especially when it comes to an aggression case where it's right. dangerous, right? There's, there's no avoiding uh, some situations where an aversive stop. has to be used Correct. to stop the behavior because your safety or somebody else's safety um, is there. Um, that being said, though, you know, it's it's important to me when I'm working with aggression cases to really focus on the emotions, the underlying uh, what's happening inside the dog, so to speak. Whereas, you know, many other cases, you don't have the same potential for risks using aversives when we're looking at modifying the underlying reason or the motivation for the behavior. So, you know, the difference between a dog jumping up on grandma that comes over to the house, just excited to see grandma. You know, there's emotions involved, but it's generally not going to be fear based yeah. or anxiety, frustration, all the typical uh, issues that can uh, function as a motivator for aggression. So I'm very careful about what I'm doing with a dog when it comes to what's happening underneath the hood, so to speak. So uh, because, as you know, you know, the, the associations um, can be easily dogs are really good <laughs> about making associations with the oddest, strangest things sometimes. You have to be careful they don't latch on to something in the environment that we're adding in uh, to that context or that antecedent arrangement in which the dog starts to perceive that as part of the picture. So it's not to say that that happens all the time at all. It's just there's a there is a risk of that. So um, so yeah. So the question about aversives is is are they completely off the table for me? No, um, and I don't think they'll they'll ever be. And I think 
as somebody like yourself that's been around for a while, you know, you have it's not again exactly. we're talking about extremism right it's never good to go into that that hole of like i'm gonna never ever use aversives ever again in my life I, I, it's not realistic i, I really it's, like that um, um and yeah it, it shouldn't I, I, it's not even just aggression i mean i i think any dog training we have to be very careful it's so easy to mm-hmm. to just suppress and stop a yeah. dog from doing something does that mean we change the dog perception of that no does that mean that um it's not gonna uh, uh, regress and wake up again in certain times since we haven't really changed the perception Mm -hmm. of course most likely it will happen um but as you say sometimes it really is very much needed for for the safety of that dog and another dog or anybody around them to be able to stop it and when we you know the the i think the good thing about sometimes with the with those extreme cases again like just like you said dogs jumping on somebody or or a, a little puppy peeing on the carpet you know this like it, it, it's amazing that people still do stupid shitty things to puppies and dogs you know it's really it's amazing <laughs> but that's it's changing yeah. but it's still there and i think i think that's just humans we yeah. you know sometimes we i don't know what why we act this way but when we when we talk about like extreme cases i think suppression is like we have two choices in my opinion or maybe i'll let me back up we have three choices because we certainly can use medication um but if we if we decide to go all differential reinforcement and without stopping a behavior chances are that it's going to make it very difficult especially especially if we cannot pinpoint the triggers or we cannot control them then suppression mm-hmm. is a very uh, um, almost needed at that moment and interestingly enough, that most likely is gonna open the door to other behaviors that we can actually reinforce now. So uh, as, as strange as it sounds, like in my opinion, sometimes suppression actually opens the door for good behavior to happen so we can reward them and, and move on to, um, and that's sometimes my my uh struggle with the two extremes because it's like okay well no we're not going to suppress we're going to wait for this and it's going to happen and we're going to keep reinforcing or the other camp is going to be no we're not going to waste time with this we're just suppressing and if it happens again we keep suppressing and ultimately Mm -hmm. as i just explained uh, in most of the cases the answer is right in the middle because we need both options what's your take yeah i think it's important to and that's the that's the issue right it's it's when there's um there's not enough in the, in that in that trainer's options of well what to do if a b or c happens right so let's use an example maybe um a dog that's you're, you're working with that has dog to human directed aggression issues and sometimes it's dog to handler aggression even if it's the owner or something like that um, and it's got a strong history of reinforcement for doing that behavior. So uh, strong negative reinforcement contingency is happening with the dogs biting the handler and whatever the handler was doing, taking them to somewhere they don't want to or touching the dog and stuff, whatever it is that's that the dog is, doesn't want to happen. So they bite. And then, you know, so the purest sense, you know, would be like, OK, just let the dog do it. We never want to punish anything, which is ridiculous when you think about it, right? So if a dog's latched onto your arm, of course you're going to do something, right? And so uh, uh, putting a stop to that behavior could be doing something like I teach in my workshops in an emergency situation is a straight arm. You know, you get to have the dog on leash, you put your arm, you hold the dog out to your side, straight arm, very classic defensive handling technique. And, you know, it's interesting to me, I actually had to navigate some of the politics of that because I'm, you know, a lot of trainers come to my workshops, not just force free, but I have, you know, trainers from all walks of life. But I did have to preface that this is an emergency handling technique because it, I, you know, it look and look like, all right, what are they training as a showing as a training technique? But you do get, of course, 
you know, you can't avoid behavior change when you're doing an emergency technique. So it's a perfect example of, okay, do we just go with, I need to be force free and never punish or use any aversives? Or do I just let the dog latch onto my arm? So it's obviously a, a, a kind of an extreme silly example, but it's a, it shows you that there are times where when it comes to aggression, we need to do things that actually stop the behavior. You know, just having the dog on leash, as you know, is, is going to is kind of a management tool, but there are elements sometimes where you have behavior change that happens just by having the leash on. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's important to understand when those techniques need to be used safely because the other argument you see is, of course, let's set the, manage, uh, let's set the environment correctly. If you set the environment correctly, then we should have errorless learning, right? Um, but that's, you know, almost impossible for the average pet owner to how do, do most feel, of the really? time, right? They can, they, so we have to equip how, them how, with those how tools. How do you feel about errorless learning? I think it's a nice concept to strive towards. And I think um, understanding, uh, you know, why we would want to do that is important, you know, to help to lower frustration. And there's arguments, of course, about teaching mm -hmm. dogs resiliency, but let's side table that for now. But just if we're looking at, do we want to reduce frustration? Do we want to avoid extinguishing behavior, which can lead to frustration and aggression? Um, so I like it. I just think just like anything else, it requires critical thought of mm -hmm. when to be doing that. Because what, as you've seen, Ivan, what we see sometimes, some the, the new technique of the week or month or whatever it is comes out and everybody's like, Ooh, I want to learn about that. And then they, that's all they talk about. And that's all they start it doing, is okay. which is okay. If you're going to do with your, maybe your own dogs and you're learning, but it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be practicing Correct. something new with all of your clients, dogs, and, and then instilling that message and then spreading it on social media. Like you're this new hottest thing, doing this message, this technique or whatever. That's where it uh, becomes problematic. It, and um, that's where, of course, the other camps are going to yep. start firing away and be like, oh, gosh, look at this silly errorless learning thing. What are they doing with that? What if the dog bites onto you? But that's they're not training an aggressive dog in that context. Maybe they're just teaching the dog how to put their paw in a box or something from errorless learning. So it's it's so much boils down to critical thought and just kind of asking questions rather than just taking a gun and shooting at that person. Right. You know, for doing for just showcasing there's something they're so learning at the same time i, I so, just kind of yeah. it's a interesting topic for me and we can we can stay a little bit on it because i i'll mm -hmm. give you my take and we'll go back and forth like um i mean sure. we know it it came from from skinner early on because he he obviously didn't believe that punish yeah. it wasn't for skinner wasn't even a moral issue it was he he sincerely openly believe that punishment is ineffective which uh, uh I, I it's obviously not the case but i think that's what stimulated him to 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 do the errorless learning and play around with it and i mean hats off it's genius in his own ways of what he did he did a lot of good things he did a lot of controversial things uh but uh, i when when I watch old videos and now now it's so easy on YouTube, but when I had to learn about it, it was uh, it was uh, I had to make a very big effort to get to these kind of videos, um, and they never really went. Obviously, ev every experiment that he did, the idea was to to transfer it to humans, so to human learning benefits and, and human society benefits and mm -hmm. so there, there was i don't know if you've, if you've seen those videos they were very cool of L errorless learning um and they're not even computers they're some kind of weird typewriters that the, that the kids at school were doing and yeah. you know yeah. and it was working on up to a certain level but then the more complicated the task became um it, yeah. it never took off because if if it was to take off. That's one thing that I think the market always tells you where things are going and if it's working or not working. Just like I always say this this about the, you know, no nobody had to force us to switch phones. Nobody had to ban the flip phones. Nobody, like, end of story, correct? <laughs> and, and the errorless learning yeah. Yeah. kind of, stopped at some point and 
I'm not, uh, again, like everything that I say, sometimes people think I'm against and I'm not against. I do. I play with everything just because it's interesting to play with. But in my opinion, the, the ultimate learning is a trial and error. Um, like we go even before Skinner to Thorndike, you know, with the cat experiments in the box and like the classic instrumental learning experiences. And I think trial and error is a very much needed to, to speed up the learning. And is there stress in it? Of course there is stress in it. But that stress is very easily overcome when you're successful. So it's up to the teacher to make sure that creates the environment that you're successful. And, and then that stress is actually a very beneficial to you because you, you learn much faster and you come out with a, a decent level of confidence at the end, right? Um, that, that's just how I feel about the, uh, yeah. that specific topic. And I play every once in a while with errorless learning, but if I need to, like if I need to make something, I feel, especially with the dogs, some of the dogs, again, like I, I work with, just like you, with, with a lot of different dogs, uh, different breeds, different, different issues. But I've been breeding Malinois for, since 89. Mm -hmm. And selected for, for what Malinois are really good at. So these are highly, highly motivated animals that if they are not successful and they know that something is not working out, they can get very frustrated. Um, and so, not that other dogs don't, but with, with Malinos, it's very pronounced that they're like, I, I, need to, I need to figure this out right now. And, and errorless learning, somehow it's, um, it blows their minds, depending again, depending what we are talking, like everybody, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. like this old philosophy, yeah. uh, I think was played or something like we all can draw a picture of a dog and we all gonna have a dog, but we all gonna have a different dog that we envision. So I'm sure as I'm talking, I'm picturing something in my head that some of the people that listen are, are seeing something else and there will be argument. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it's not a very as familiar um, term in the dog training community, I think, as, as some of the other things that we've been bouncing around over the last decade or so. It's It's been around for a long time. It just hasn't made it into the dog training community until at least the last couple of years, maybe even less. Um, yes, depending, yes. I guess in which circle <laughs> you're in. But I, I think for me, it's, it's actually gr a good exercise for not so much for the dog, but for the handler, uh, the trainer, to become aware of their own training skills, their own timing, their own mechanics, their own setting of criteria, setting of the environment. I think that's very helpful for them uh, to see those things. And more importantly, to recognize when they may need to switch gears, depending on the dog they have in front of them, based on the emotions that they might be reading through behavior and body language. So is that errorless learning stressful for this dog? Or is it something I'm doing as a trainer that's a mistake that's being stressful for this dog? Or do I need to switch to another modality in which can be more communicative to this dog? It kind of, it reminds me of this. Um, I remember attending this one conference many years ago and um, these really, really uh, brilliant clicker trainers were there uh, giving a, a, a seminar and they were very skilled with their mechanics. Their timing was just, just spotless. However, one of the things that really stuck with me is, you know, this was during the, um, after the, uh, hours, sort of question and answer <laughs> after the talk. And mm. yeah, and, uh, well, it was still on stage. So it was, they were still in front of the audience, but, uh, they were asked, you know, so if you were to tell trainers one thing to stop doing, uh, with your dogs, what would it be? And the, the answer just, you know, was shocking from them and they were like, stop talking to your dogs. And for many of us, yeah. like. It, you just shake your head like you you get what they mean in that context of yes if you want to have clean mechanics and let the clicker do the talking that's what it applies to but i can see a lot of trainers heads just go like being blown up like oh my gosh you never want me to talk to my dog again so you can see how these messages get misconstrued and i think errorless learning has that same kind of potential for miss uh you know misinterpretation it's not as 
um, yeah. militaristic yeah. as it sounds. <laughs> and I think it's another thing that can hone your skills, but it's certainly not something I would, I would strive for with my clients or, you know, it's, it's something to just, you know, play with and then become better at as a trainer and it's going to hone your skills, but, uh, definitely don't want to make that your only tool or your philosophy because that could go dangerously wrong. I think in some cases, but also cause a lot of so clicker. Dogs let's if we're not let's careful. let's hit this one because it's another good one. What is, in your opinion, the 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 best of the clicker, and what is the worst of the clicker? Like, what what does it bring that it's really, really, really beneficial, and what can be that it sucks in a way? Have you thought of that? Yeah, I, you know what? It, I guess it depends which lens I'm looking through. Is it for the, just the aggression? I would say general you know, the work I do with aggression or just in general? To start with, the aggression is yeah. always complicated I, I think it's been to, in, to, yeah. to talk in generic terms like that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, in, in short, the short and sweet answer to with aggression cases, I hardly ever use them because it's, it's just one more tool for my clients to carry. If the dog's already clicker savvy, I'll probably use it, but I'm not going to have more things that the client has to learn. Verbal marker works just as fine in most aggression cases. Um, sure. If they're doing other things like sports and, you know, all the other things where clickers are useful. I like sure. it. Sure. But uh, so that's my short answer there. But in terms of the, you know, the, the whole community, the dog training community, I think it's been a wonderful uh, tool to introduce to us, you know, from the other animal training worlds. I think it's been a brilliant a way for us to get very good at our mechanics, timing, um, learning how, you know, just the system of marker training, but it's, it's been a great addition to the dog training it, um, world. It amplified um, so that, and that, how positive reinforcement, the power of positive reinforcement through shaping, it really amplified it mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. It was kind of, it was definitely a cool new thing at the time. Correct. Even though it wasn't quite so new at the time, but it was new to the dog training community. And uh, I think it was a wonderful thing, of course. I mean, we saw so, of course, saw many, many great things come out of it. But um, the negative, you know, it's, um, I think the negative is just it created purists, clicker purists. So, in other sense, you get the extreme again of somebody saying, this is the only way to train and you must use this. If you're not using right, this, you're right. an, either ignorant or evil person, depending on the tool you're using. So, that was the unfortunate side of it, of the politics of tools. You know, and that can happen with any tool, of course. We see it happen with all the tools that come out. But uh, clicker training especially created a, a segment mm -hmm. of um, purists, I would say, in a small segment. There's plenty of people out there using clickers. I don't, I don't want to certainly demonize any of them. Yes. And, and I, I use clickers all the time myself if it's for other aspects of training. But, yeah, there's. I think that was, if I was to pick one thing where something negative came out of it, that would be it. But I, I yeah. would say that's, you know, as you've seen with, with any tool, People, I have my, my take is it. I actually have two. I mean, obviously, I agree with you on the upside of, of you know, it's it's a as, as yeah, there is no question. The downside, um, one, one of the things is that it's almost the same as somebody holding a remote control. And just because everybody's holding a remote control for electric or shock collar, whichever word you want to choose, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. immediately put mm -hmm. them in the same. It's like, no, th this is the person and the trainer you are. And that's very misleading. That's very misleading. And with clicker, I think it's the same thing. Yeah. Like just because somebody holds a clicker in their hand, it doesn't make them a good trainer. It doesn't make them a bad trainer. But somehow it's through through time that these misconceptions and perceptions uh, about holding a clicker versus holding a remote collar it, it puts you in a certain category of not even a trainer a type of person you are and but it can be very 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 false misleading yeah. uh, um, start to to look at the person yeah 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 it, it's like walking to into a bar in let's say in between new york and boston and somewhere in connecticut and you either have a new york yankees hat on or a boston red sox hat on <laughs> you know you are immediately put into a category 
And the same thing happens with tools. You see a video with a trainer using any of those tools that, that tells you just the tool they're using at that time. Right. It tells you really not a whole lot about that person. We're very which quick, is sad. Very quick just to jump to this, search. You put um, this immediate yeah. label up. The other one, the other one that I yeah. have that it's a little more in the, the actual training aspect is that the clicker in, in a lot of ways forces you to detach yourself from the emotional side of training and focus on the behavior itself mm. yeah. and only the behavior itself. But good training, really good training, cannot ignore emotions. Like you have to be able to attach certain emotion with certain behavior if you want to to be a very good trainer. And it's a, something that very rarely is talked about. Um, but, or, or when it's talked about, there is, you know, I mean, every single dog trainer talks about emotions today, you know that. But, but actually attaching behavior yeah. To a Thank specific you. emotion, <laughs> it's a very, very different topic, and I think clicker kind of m challenges you to to stay present and n not to focus strictly on behaviors, because that's not ultimately that's not dog training of today. Right. I, I, that's and I'm so glad that people are going back to looking at dogs' emotions because there was a small period of time there where you know the emotions were really pushed off to the side or completely. Uh, not even talked about, uh, which was really sad to see. But yeah, I think again, it's 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 changing again. To step, we, we're recognizing the rich emotional lives of animals, especially dogs. And uh, but yeah, I, I think you're right. It's it it can feel very mechanical, to, for lack of a better word, or you know, unemotional when you're just holding something in your hand. And you're going through the monsters, and you can see just what that story I was right. telling you about the clicker trainers that were saying, "Don't talk to your dog." I understand the context and everything. You want to be a good trainer. Focus on that one skill so the talking doesn't distract you or elicit other behaviors where you think it's what you're doing with the clicker. That I get, but but you should. If you want to learn that, yeah, just, just focus on the clicker training first, maybe get good at your timing, then then incorporate the other stuff you know, like how you use your body language or like how you're talking to the dog or the emotions that you're recognizing in the dog. It all starts to add up to this robust picture. Uh, but yeah, it's it can Very get, true. I think, um, yeah, when people focus on that one thing uh, too much, they can sort of lose sight of the other things. And, and it's, it's what we've seen in different sciences and different lenses of looking at behavior. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. may, might have heard me talk about this before, but you know, if somebody's deeply into a particular behavior science, such as ABA or orthology, or, you know, depending on what lens they look, look through, it can sometimes lead you down a path of not forgetting, but not incorporating some of these other sciences yeah. as much as we should. Yeah. It's in, a, this is behavior. yeah very, so, very uh, good point. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know, like I, my, my opinion, regardless of what all trainers talk about, but when I see, when I see people train dogs, I think they're stuck in, in not even in like the more modern type of behaviorism, but the Skinnerian behaviorism. And um, a lot of times we get, we really as trainers get stuck and not, you know, yes, we do talk about theology. Yes, we do talk about evolutionary psychology, but when it comes down to actually doing things, most trainers are like, oh, I'm the dog trainer, I can fix stuff. No, you cannot fix stuff that's baked in your DNA for who knows how many hundreds of thousands of years. Like the, the best mm -hmm. you can do is try to guide it somewhere to where mm -hmm. it's not a problem anymore. But, but it's typical, um, I think yeah. young dog trainers um, or trainers that are yeah, I don't know, but it's out there. It's for sure out there that uh, not not respecting the the genetic makeup, not the, not respecting the um, the environment, and 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 basically say, okay, we we will fix it. It's like no, it's like you will fix some, you will stop the dog from something, and it's gonna either pop out somewhere else or you're gonna mentally just crumble mm -hmm. the dog's brain because that that's not what we do right that's that's not the point <laughs> of dog training yeah um 
How do you feel? I have another one <laughs> yeah. for you. Yeah. I told you we can talk all night. So you tell me when it's plenty. But in the force free community, and, and again, like I'm not, I, I understand that you're not quite in the extreme, but you're probably the first person that I have access to, you know, have that conversation with. So I'm very interested to hear, uh, like, Mm. There, there is, I, I don't, I don't want to sound funny, but it almost seems like the same, the same probably goes in the other extreme. But like the force-free people, it's like, who is more force-free? It's like, no, I, I'm like a different level than you. <laughs> like this is, you, you're not there yet. Yeah. Where I'm going with this? Do you, how, how do you feel about telling the dog, no, don't do that? some some you know because this i know it's a problem for many yeah <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> i don't know i don't know where, where that i mean it got really extreme where i think it's again the the culture that was happening and the, the politics as well and uh, you were absolutely right. It's sort of like this pedestal. Who can be the most force-free? Who can be at the there is something most like this, right? The spectrum where you do no wrong to the dog. For sure, definitely, definitely. And well, we see it on both sides, right? You know, you see, um, you know, it's just. But it, it's unfortunate, yeah. So there's this pedestal. Like I can be higher. I can be more force-free than this person. I'm not using any kind of aversives. I'm uh, choice and control, agency, and you know, which are important concepts, but. Again, the extremes is where the problem happens. And so there was this whole conversation about saying no to a dog. And, you know, it, it's all it, the, the, it, all of these conversations really, they require more critical thought because 99% of dogs you can say no to. And then you're like, yeah. okay, I won't do that. Or I understand what you're saying. It's communication. And we do it all day long, right. even if we're not saying N-O to a dog. So let's let's just what if we just look at the dog a certain way or we show if like we get disgusted with something or ups or frustrated with something just our facial expression alone whether we know it or not is communicating to the dog so we are saying no many times and in these including these people that are on, putting themselves on this extreme pedestal of i never do anything well let's really test that let's see are you able to hold no facial expression are you able to never breathe a certain way because your dog is certainly going to pick up on those things and so, um, yeah, for some reason, no is like another four letter word, but fortunately that's also coming back into, okay, we can say no to our dogs. We're not right. saying no. And then like doing awful things to them. Right. We say no. And it's communication. I so, mean, I guess um, at some, at some yeah, point, it's, you know, it has it's to, fortunate. Uh, so, so it doesn't become just no. And then it becomes a scream and then it becomes, there's gotta be some some sort of consequence which ultimately right. will mm -hmm. make the the that disapproval um uh, um condition punisher correct yeah. i mean that's really what it is and and nothing really needs to happen yeah of course yeah. we can add some aversives of of any sorts of aversives or or as you said your demeanor changes your the dogs just like there were some very cool studies of, um, I don't know where that was, but that's another thing. Like I just love, I'm obsessed with studies, like completely obsessed. But there was a, a very good one at, at probably early 2000s. Uh, and it was about people that actually don't have dogs and that don't just, just person that is not around dogs. Mm -hmm. And they give them, uh, uh, pictures or videos, I can't remember, of different dogs uh, behaving in a different way, showing, displaying different body language. It was unbelievable how everybody knew that that dog is afraid. Okay, uh, fear and, and the dog's gonna bite me and why is it gonna bite me was a little bit sketchy, but in the overall, like the affect, you know, of, of emotions everybody mm -hmm. knew and is capable to read the dogs and um so yeah i i think it goes obviously both ways right so it's very easy for a dog to to know my person yeah. is not happy right now about whatever it is 
and then that gets paired correct and then it becomes and that's going to be paired punisher. with an aversive ex- and for yeah. some maybe they are just too yeah. oblivious yeah. and too confident and they're like oh, yeah whatever my mom's talking maybe the consequences get to the point where ah i know what you mean i respect it now um but that's a good to know that uh, things are changing because i think we can go so far before we we totally lose our minds and 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 we end up not being able to control dogs and if we cannot control dogs then then we cannot have dogs anymore right yeah, yeah, yeah i mean and i think yeah this yeah unfortunately and if we can jump into that topic of you know choice and control and agency and how that's become uh, somewhat mainstream now which in some ways is a good thing but also i get questions about um you know what what do you do in an aggression case obviously you can't let a dog like if i took one of your protection trained malinois for instance and just took them out with me in public you know and it, am i just going to give that dog complete agency and choice and control or just let them do what they want and then i'm going to hope my my cues and them get good stimulus control on that dog is going to work out or or what happens when that agitator comes towards me, right? And you've trained it to bite. Uh, you know, that's a perfect example of where it's not reasonable to give dogs. And that happens, of course, all the time with our clients. We, that's what we put management in place for, is to, to prevent that choice and control in some scenarios. So again, there's another example of where the extreme take on it and this is i'm going to give fair credit to the to the force free community of course, as well it's of course. not like they're all running around saying just you know just let the dogs out loose and nobody use leash but but there is a i have seen that conversation where it gets a little extreme where there's uh unfortunate expectations about what you know what we should be doing how we should be talking you know communicating with our dogs the management uh we should be putting i mean there has to be um, so there has to for sure like Every person that lives with a dog, okay, I, I have to back up again. I hate to say every and like put everything because it's just never the right way to do it. But <laughs> oh my God, yeah, yeah. I, it's very hard. <laughs> so you're learning the, 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 but for the, the most right part, language. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> um, dogs have to, <laughs> they have to follow certain rules in order to 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 everybody to actually live peacefully in the family and everybody to like the dog and not the dog to end up in a shelter or to be put down there there has to be some structure and Mm -hmm. some rules and i think we have to agree to that now where it gets tricky is how do we go about establishing rules and we get to get even more tricky is the unfair comparison between a certain dog that has some very mild minor like like a I wouldn't even say it's a problem because you can you can tell him not to do it or you can live with it and it's no big deal either way but then there is a different dog in a different situation that it's mm-hmm. just simply not acceptable or, or we have to encourage them to do something different. And somehow we zoom them into the same pot and we say, well, this worked for the little dog or for the easy problem dog. It means it's universal. That happens. That's, that's a problem, a big problem when you think about it. And, you know, if we just take a step back from and look at all of the dogs, right? So if, if we look back, if we look at all dogs in general, so we look at the 1 billion or so dogs on the planet, 750 million or so are not owned by anybody. So there are technically no rules in the way we see them as trainers put on those dogs, but there's plenty of rules on t- those dogs have to navigate the society, the culture they're in, whether they're out in the desert uh, somewhere or they're in a, t- a garbage dump in My Mexico or places, you know, it depends the on their culture. So y- y- every, there's, there's rules everywhere, right? But then we expect them to have rules in our environment, which is our home. So the average pet dog or, the, you know, and um, then that can even, even in those, that we take those 250 million dogs that are sort of owned, many of those are still have plenty of freedom in other countries, but in places like the US, we know there's extreme restrictions on dogs. 
And we have to look at the rules that we place in those cultures. And then you look at the microculture of our home environment. So you, that a home in New York City is going to be different than a home in rural Kentucky, right? And so I think, again, this critical thought process is to come in when we're talking about things like agency and choice of control and, and the culture of that dog, that individual dog. And that's where, the, again, the arguments just run wild because if you have a trainer out, again, in rural right. Kentucky arguing with a trainer in New York City, there's almost no point in them to having a conversation about rules and structure because it's two totally different environments. And maybe the dog in New York City is a Malinois and the dog in Kentucky is a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. It's almost not worth having the conversation at that point because you're, you're talking about how to grow an orange in Florida. And you're talking about how to grow an apple in Connecticut. It's, you know, you can have some maybe conversation, but it's not going to be. It's going to be pointless if they keep hammering. Oh, you're an awful trainer because sure. you're not doing sure. you're not giving that dog agency in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> that Malinois, poor yes, dog, yes, you know, yes. it's being restricted so terribly. How dare you? And the other one is also, I think, in in our society, yeah. even being Kentucky, being New York, there's still some similarities. And, and this is the sometimes very unreasonable expectations of mm -hmm. a dog how to behave in the house. To, to the point where you... Yeah. Uh, it, it makes you wonder why do you have a dog because that's like you really don't like dogs do certain things they you know like if you take all that away from them like what what do you make out of them like how how can this dog live a, a fulfilled happy life meaningful you know and and you know it's yeah. just like i mean i don't want to go into too, too crazy but i i think it's a big problem and somehow we do fail in educating a lot of trainers of of hey it, it really is okay he he's a dog this is this is what dogs do, do um sometimes this is not acceptable and as long as we can control it and say okay this is not acceptable right now or or you can change it in some ways but to to totally be on their ass and and it's like no you cannot do that you're gonna stay in place and you're gonna whatever and the person comes to visit and you you go to place and it's like why like it's it's the dog is just as happy that somebody's coming to say hello now you can yeah. teach him how to behave around but putting him away it's unless we're talking with some again extreme aggressive cases then it's a different story but and then again uh, like yeah. making the dog i don't know like um, sit when you open the door. It's like, okay, no, I, I walk out first. It's like, really? I mean, the dog's just happy to go out and have fun with you, with you. you know? He has no, yeah. no problem who's gonna walk out first at the door. Like, yeah. what, what are we doing? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But there is, yeah. it's a big yeah. thing and it kind of goes into which I also want to kind of hear your take on this, the whole dominance thing, because that, that's kind of obviously where this is going, I guess, with, you know, oh, no, he's going to wait for his food and I'm going to eat first and he will never have food from the table. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I surprise probably a lot of people with my dogs that I compete and I do so well with, because, yeah, sometimes they take food because I give them from the table. Some, m most of the times they're on the bed and I tell them to get off the bed because now I want to, or whatever. But there, there is like, a, a, I like to give my dogs a lot of slack and be dogs and just like as much as w how I live in the house, they have pretty much the same rights of the house, assuming that there is some rules and there is times where we say, hey, slow it down right um but dominance that's another big for for so many years a big topic a big big fight of of, mm -hmm. of extremes where do you stand on this because <coughs> dominance is also yeah. very difficult sorry to interrupt. yeah it's uh, um because again kind of like yeah. i was saying yeah you and i can draw up a dog and we have a dog but they don't look the same obviously because we imagine something else um 
And I think that's the dangerous uh, uh, problem with when we talk about dominance. But so, so like I think, you know, that the whole theory is based on the idea that dogs are pack animals. And this, I don't know how we can argue it. We can we can put a different word, social, but they they live in a number of dogs or in families uh, of humans. But you know, they they're they're together. So they're where I'm going with is there is certain level of hierarchy and clearly like nobody seems to argue that there is submission, right? Like you can recognize it immediately when a dog is submissive. But so mm-hmm. if there is a yin, yeah. there is a yang. I'll let you talk. Yeah. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing I saw, well, uh, even before I started training, I think it was already happening, but right. the the whole dominance or D word <laughs> is how they even describe it. So people don't even want to talk about it, uh, which is sad because it is a thing. It, it's um, I think it's because of the messaging that was coming from some trainers that were applying. I agree. Yes, very and ugly so and doing very things stupid, that, dumb things. No question. Uh, like just, we, we you know, should not sugarcoat you know, this. There is no, yeah, no place. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. And, and it's sad because you're blaming, in a way, that, you know, scientifically sound term actually started getting blamed for what the trainers were doing. So the messaging was wrong. And anytime you're trying to sell anything to anybody, whether it's a concept or a product, and for the messaging wrong, it's going to get, and if it's bad messaging, especially, they're going to ban it or cancel it, right, in these days. So that's what happened with, with dominance and um, it, because of, you know, people taking to extremes and doing bad things to dogs in the name of dominance uh but dominance does exist and unfortunately it's one of those right. things in the dog world that didn't get talked about enough or shh, don't talk about it i think you know, we, don't even educate like, yourself uh, about um, it because it's a bad word but it does, is it's you know again i i absolutely agree with the force free yeah. community that there, there is like unacceptable and uh, just like heartbreaking unacceptable behaviors that happen every day because of this idea of I I am mm-hmm. the alpha and I am gonna teach you a lesson and I am and, and so yeah. on. But ultimately I think they ended up throwing the baby with the water. Yeah. And it's and it's an important concept to understand, especially for for any trainers working with dog dog aggression cases. I mean it's something you really have to pay attention to and the dynamics and the social relationships that can happen in a home, whether it's two dogs or ten dogs. You really have to know what you're seeing there. Yes, you can often get away with if you just want mm-hmm. to go with a straight, you know, ABC contingency evaluating how we want to change the behavior. That's that'll help, but it's not going to be the whole picture um, because dominance exists in the dog world. And if you if you study dogs, and and that was the other unfortunate thing too, when we saw a lot of again Skinnerism come to, into the dog training world, which is a good thing. Not, right. Nothing bad with that at all. It's just that it pushed everything else to the side, including ethology. And if you look at any other science, you know that looks at animal behavior, they never say, oh, dominance doesn't exist. Of course, it exists in in many species, and including dogs. Um, it's just, uh, again, the messaging was all wrong and how, how to apply it to dog training and dog behavior. So, um, yeah, I think it's important to, to know what's happening. I know, I think we, especially when it comes to resources, of course, how to apply, uh, the knowledge and understanding to behavior cases, especially in those dog relationships. Um, we have to be super uh, but careful. We also have to be careful too, in our messaging to clients, you know, cause they have their own ideas, right? They have their own messaging and marketing in their head. And so we have to sometimes unpack it and help them understand because it can what they could be doing is harmful or maybe they're not recognizing something so yes. it's one of those it's, it's just a strange thing that, that that's that occurs in the dog training culture uh when a bad word comes God, out i like wants that. to talk about I, it I, it's, I agree it's important with to you. talk about these things i think it's it's critical to talk about it and and because if we because if we don't talk about it I think I think it's subconsciously we 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 know it it's a fact of nature. We 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 can we can even just say the right, right. things because society expects us to say the right things so we are one of the the group but ultimately we on on subconscious level understand that this is not necessarily the case. And if we go if we take it all away, or if we just focus on that, both are wrong. 
Um, like for example, al- alpha roll. Man, I mean, it sounds horrible, right? And it is horrible. Mm-hmm. But you have seen it. I have seen it. Anybody that has been around dogs have seen a dog rolling himself in an alpha roll, so to speak, just to show uh, we're cool. Mm-hmm. No, nothing. And I'm not saying that this has actual application as a yeah. the, the family member or the dog trainer that they should do what the dog already understands because it's totally misused and it's, there is no, like I, I absolutely, mm-hmm. just to, so we are clear on this, the, uh, there is no place for us to do that. There is so many better ways to establish uh, um, who is who in the house in a much gentle and, and much, and, and I think we need to teach this, but at the same time to say that that totally doesn't exist, that's where it becomes, that's where people yeah. start to be like, hold on, you, you just went too far. I've seen dogs, I've seen wolves, I've seen lions, yeah. I've seen zebras, they all submit to somebody <clears throat> and it and it does a disservice to the education of the community but also discredits whoever's saying that you know it kind of says well it's imagine mm. like imagine if we start talking about something else like predatory behavior or predatory motor sequence for instance and we just started saying no that p word doesn't don't talk about the p word because that's a bad thing predation or predatory behavior because you know dogs can kill cats some times or something like that and then you have imagine if you had a subset of trainers be like they they subscribe to the predatory model of dog training right and the way they train is like to grab a dog and bite them on the back of their leg like their prey or some some ridiculous thing right and imagine right how that could impact things and like oh don't talk about the predatory more sequence that doesn't exist it sounds ridiculous when you Correct. say it but that's what's happened with things like dominance and other concepts in ethology that do exist, you know, breed specific behaviors, for instance, you know, and fortunately that's also shifting in the right direction again. But at at one point we saw like, oh, it's all about how you raise them or how you train them and it has nothing to do with the breed. And you're just like, (laughs) sometimes you're like, where where did that idea come from? And uh, again, we're going back to the extremes, but yeah. So um yeah it's uh we do have to like i, think, I like I think. like the, the conversation you and i are having right now i i totally love the conversation and and again like you can absolutely yeah. disagree with something that i say and i'm i'm fine with that yeah. but what that's gonna the way i'm gonna benefit of that is even if i don't agree i would understand where you're coming from and i have the opportunity to actually converse with you and ask you yeah. how did you come about that to where if we if we just start putting slogans and statements on social media mm-hmm. we don't have the conversation we completely move yeah. away from each other forever it's kind of like the expanding universe <laughs> yeah and that's exactly it just what i was saying before and then you get more likes and more shares and people right. positively reinforcing your 10 word meme <laughs> that says something that's very, uh, you know, critical to another party in the dog training industry, what's it going to do? It's just going to burn that bridge and you're just going to both, you're just going to dig your ditch a little deeper to, to trench in more to your thoughts and your mindset without ever asking that other person, Hey, tell me your side of the story. Teach me more about that, you know, or teach me more yes. about how to use that tool yes. so I can understand it that's and the, I can choose whether I'm going to use it or That's what I really let me wish. Understand it. Right. I, I know it's a wishful thinking, but that's that's what maybe I don't know, maybe this is some some kind of a start <laughs> and maybe we can keep talking and we can, you know, again, we absolutely don't need to agree on everything. Yeah. But I think I know I can pick up stuff. I'm sure you can pick up stuff and I know everybody that's listening can pick up stuff and and we grow and we evolve mm-hmm. to become better for a important cause ultimately um how is like uh, yeah absolutely absolutely i don't know if i touch this but let's go punishment punishment so we have like it's a 
very widely accepted in in the force free community if we if there's going to be any punishment it will be negative punishment which means we will withhold a reinforcer a reward mm-hmm. and 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 so on yeah um then we have the positive punishment which obviously is some use of aversive we have timeout all all few different variations of timeouts which are some can be very 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 mm-hmm. just just really bad idea but um I, again I don't want to go to that extent but how how did negative punishment become the go to approach for the force free community i think because it's not positive punishment <laughs> i mean for a simple answer but um yeah it's because of the tool usage right and the politics at the time so with things like e collars or prong collars that people were you know uh, taking issue with is that the mechanism is all, of course is negative reinforcement but positive punishment is in their mindset that's like oh that's of a course. positive punishment tool shaker cans squirt bottles and it all falls into this kind of lumped into this category of oh so if these tools are really bad in my mindset because of the cultural influences that we're having in our conversations and these memes and social media I was talking about that puts into the mindset that okay all of this is going to be anything in the positive punishment category is by virtue bad so um so then mm-hmm. of course negative punishment well that's not so bad cuz it's withholding a treat for instance so on paper you're like oh of right. course that's that's right. much less bad but is it right and not and, you know i'm not to say that uh, you know i'm going to tell anybody to just go start using positive punishment of course not but it means that we do have to have critical yes. thought because somebody withholding a treat from a dog can actually get dangerous in some cases. Yes, I agree. This that's exactly where I was going. I, I'll let you I'll let you finish your thought, but that's exactly where I was going yeah. with to to where so, I think yeah. Yeah. no question. Yeah. Positive uh, negative punishment works. No question positive punishment works. There is place for each. There is always one better than the other. Yeah. Yeah. I the problem and i tell you the problem with positive punishment but the problem i have with negative punishment is that it's sold as this benign thing that we can do randomly and it's okay the dog's not you know we can punish it but at the same time we are not cruel we are not torturing it and the, the welfare and the moral ethics and so on we are actually preserving and that's really not the case in, in some instances mm-hmm. it's it's just as sold as a yeah, we can punish and it's it's benign and it's not benign um um i mean there's very good studies when we look at neuroscience and how the brain functions and and yeah. and ultimately the way the brain perceives negative punishment is really not different at all as how the brain perceives positive punishment it's an aversive response and an emotional a uh, a state that creates the same the same emotional state with the same uh uh mm-hmm. yeah and we have yeah. to my yeah. point is we yeah. have to be That's an aversive. we have to still be careful how we do it and when we do it and how often we do it but somehow we are failing to talk about yeah. this or at least i have the feeling yeah. that the force free community fails to 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 accept yeah. it as or 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 to to say what i just said i'll argue that it's for me it's it's not so much either community not under it's it's more of a misunderstanding of those particular contingencies and what's happening i think uh, we see the same argument oh, yeah. too from balanced or i guess if we were to, to label the balanced community sometimes the argument is you know about you know what the difference is or you know using positive punishment sometimes even the misconstrued as positive reinforcement or mislabeling of it 
And that's the unfortunate part of those things is that sometimes you, you, people are having, trying to have these conversations. They don't really haven't studied the, you know, applied behavior analysis and those degrees. So you get these odd arguments and you're just like, okay, so first I got to explain what this is. And then even then it's confusing for that, for somebody just learning it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, negative punishment can be much more aversive to an animal. So it's not us, it's not up to the trainer to decide what's worse for the dog. It's the dog's decision. Is withholding a treat worse than, you know, a stim from a collar? That's the dog to let us know. They're going to let us know loud and clear if we're good at watching, if we're good at listening. Um, and that's the, the argument that's being missed. And, and, and if right. we got together as a community and said, hey, why don't we get together and actually talk about what the dogs are saying to us, not what we think we should be saying to each other, right? Because we can argue that point all day long. You and I could be like, oh, no, you got to use this collar. Well, we're not going to know until we actually start working with the dog. The dog's going to tell us loud and clear, hey, this works. I don't like this. And you're doing this wrong, right? The, the dog's going to tell us. Positive punishment, it's, it's a little bit more obvious. The dog immediately, like immediately tells you that things went wrong and, and, um, you know, um, right. But but this is where it becomes very difficult for me to understand how, because I, I believe that I'm just as, if not more, like I, I want dog trainers to treat dogs with utmost respect and dignity and do whatever it needs to be done. But, there is a big but, you cannot cross certain lines because, oh, this is a hard one for me to even talk about. And it's gonna go back to what you just said. Some, sometimes it's, a, it's truly just a matter of education and some people have put time to to learn and to study and to get better and some people are staying on a very surface of things of dog training and they see that somebody does that they see that it's not just somebody but there is now the bunch of likes of that somebody and then it becomes a norm and then it becomes you know the dangerous and the mm -hmm. uncalled for approach becomes a norm and then, as a response mm -hmm. to that, we take another extreme. And then we're just playing this ping pong. How do we end it? Like, how do we, how do we come to, ultimately, as, as we started that conversation, we all have the best interests of the dog at heart but we keep growing apart any idea how do we how do, where do we go what do we need to do i think i think there's there needs to be a whole lot more showing and doing instead of criticizing and spending our energies attacking the methods of others and and especially when it's done to grow someone else, you know, your own platform, if you're doing that out there and, and, you know, criticizing others work because that works too. That gets attention, that gets likes, that gets people focused on, you know, especially if it looks like what you're saying is right. Yeah. Some, sometimes the person's absolutely right, but I don't think that's the way to, to grow yourself and to grow your brand, to grow the message, to, to build the community, to build bridges. I think it's going to just do the opposite. So I think with the messaging, but I tell anybody that, you know, that whether they're just first starting out or maybe they are on the sort of main stage, maybe they are doing conferences and webinars and workshops and they're teaching other trainers is to continue. Just just do what you do, you know, just show the world that this is how I train. If you like it, great. I'll show you more. If not, that's OK, too. Not everybody's going to agree with me. And some people will attack me at the same time for doing what I'm doing. But I'm never going to actually just go back and try to attack those people because it doesn't make sense to do that. It's a waste of energy unless it's a. You know, there's, of course, certain examples where you do have to defend yourself, but most of the time you can just ignore and just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to have much more influence and people are going to see that. People are going to see that messaging that you're doing. Can you be kind to others without criticizing them? Can you show your training and do you do what you do and but show that you care about dogs true. in a genuine way without doing it 
in a marketing sense or worrying about money or worrying about but how do you just do it you know just show everybody else what you're doing and that's that's you know something I, i i've been striving to do for a long time you know and it's and it's the message i'll just keep doing you know you'll never right. hear me attack how do you reach the other side from each side this is this yeah. is like really the problem because again like how how uh, that analogy that i just yeah earlier mentioned with the smartphone and the flip phone you know like mm-hmm. when i think when when something works and we can yeah. show and demonstrate this is why we have workshop this is why we invite people this is you know that's where we share ultimately mm-hmm. all dog trainers want to be better and i i want to believe that no matter what ideology and what the narrative and what somebody follows when you see a better way and i'm talking about ultimately a better way not just like whatever a quick fix and all this uh, you know salad type of words mm-hmm. but actually really a better way mm-hmm. how do you not take it Yeah. So why are we not able yeah to share and say hey I think I have a better way and maybe somebody questions you and say well I don't think so because there is this way and it works better and then we start to talk not fight but actually talk and then we take everything under consideration then we say well okay we have is the dog going to how the dog feels where what emotion stress uh reliability we take everything under consideration then we take how important this is do we do i mean is it really that important or is it okay because again as i say my dogs that i win world championships with if you see me on the street you will hire a trainer for me like seriously <laughs> but, but I totally get we, what you're saying. Why can too. we not <laughs> do this? I totally get what you're saying. Um I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we we well, we need look at what this. we're doing right now. I mean, you and I are having a conversation, right? Yeah, and it, and it's a good conversation, right? And and we're agreeing on 99.9% of everything we're talking about because that's, you know, we we're, we're just talking things through and right. we're talking about you know things that could be controversial on a Facebook page somewhere or somebody's Instagram feed or any other forum but you know the conversations like this happen because you know you reached out to me and then you know but of course I was as like, you of say course, of I'm course I'm talk to Ivan and and so right that's what we right. need to see more of and then if we the more you see that that's, you know you kind of lead by example right you're leading by example and that right right let's face it too you know you have an audience i'm sure many balance trainers if we were to, again I, i i wish we could get away from those labels some at some point in our lives but you know again we'll just use them for the sake of this conversation but like you might have balance trainers listening to your podcast and of course oh, yes. people will know that they're going to give us hard time have, for sure you know, the force free trainers coming on some listening. will give us and hard time they're getting exposed Wait. to the exactly exactly yeah and that's so they're getting exposure to each other's yeah. message right hopefully that's that's the whole point of that yeah. that was my idea of what i wanted to do and and i think we are making it happen uh, like i'm super happy of having conversation and and i'm honestly like 120% okay if we don't agree on certain things because yeah. Yeah. i i think it's absolutely this is humans like we we don't have to agree but disagreeing doesn't mean let's go into war let's understand right. each other why we disagree yeah. and 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 if you have a better way or maybe i don't want to take this way but if it's a better way man how do you not take it if if you're a dog trainer yeah. and and there is something that somebody does better in in as a package mm-hmm. and you're like no I I just yeah, cannot I it, my my yeah. brain cannot comprehend that this is even possible. It's a message I always tell you know I I try to leave with my students is that even if you don't agree with everything you're seeing a trainer do which which <laughs> honestly it actually should be you know if you agree with 100% of somebody else's training that's you know that's kind of saying something that you, maybe you're 
there's something we're not being critical enough with our own thoughts. But I think if there's so much you can learn from from other trainers, regardless of their training methodology, you know, I've I've did it all the time growing through my careers. I don't care less what kind of tools people are using. I want to go see somebody experienced in their craft and their what they're doing, their focus. And you're going to learn so much almost all the time. You know, so if you go to a workshop, it may not be, again, somebody that's training methodology you necessarily agree with, but you're going to be able to pull little things. And you can be a good consumer, of course. I'm not saying just go attend every workshop willy nilly. But, you know, if it's something that might interest you, you're going to learn. And I try to instill that into my students all the time just because it's not maybe, you know, what we would classify as a force free trainer. Let me tell you, there's there's a lot you can learn from from other trainers out there, um, especially if it's it's in a, a particular area that you don't focus on like dog sports for instance is totally different for me or nose work it's not something i focus on Mm -hmm. or agility but i'm going to learn a lot when i go watch those people even regardless of you know their training methodology so i think um i think that should be another take-home message for the whole community is just like keep learning from each other and stop criticizing like you know just ask questions you know ask those questions that come from curiosity hey what are you doing there without the hey, why are you doing that kind of tone behind it, right? right. That we often right. see. And that's the other thing, too, is that I think, uh, uh, you know, besides learning things when we're going through our career as dog trainers, like body language, behavior, we should learn. One of the skills we should learn is people skills of how to just have a conversation. Because yep. let's face it, when we're working with dogs, we're working with people. And if we don't know how to work with the people and have conversations, then we're screwed, <laughs> right? We're not going to make much of an impact for that oh, dog. And if we really care about the dogs, we really should care about the people we're working with. So. Okay. Yeah, the the people aspect is is actually probably seventy percent, in my opinion. Um, yeah, if not more, sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's no question. So that's the, the to go back to where we were, like seeing something and experience something once. It's not sufficient to scratch off Mm -hmm. everything about uh, an approach or 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 and and in fact you can even again like think of force free think balance think through whatever the training is but when you when we look at something and we look at something we we really if we want to learn we need to look at the most the, the most brilliant approach of that uh, approach that mm-hmm. didn't sound right yeah but you know yeah, because yeah. as it like like somebody that says well yeah I, I'm, I'm doing this and the master doing this is so different and we we fail to to search the source and finding the source so to speak is not so easy because everybody today is the source so we have to use intelligence we have to but but we shouldn't give up because clearly every aspect of dog training is successful and clearly every aspect of dog training uh, um is not harmful and it's not necessarily you know it can be and it doesn't have to be Mm -hmm. like i i know that i can put make up a big bet and bring two or three or four or five dogs this was something with michael ellis we were talking Mm -hmm. and they will have no colors no equipment whatsoever nobody will ever be able to tell how those dogs are trained it just there is no no way um and that means that when you take care of the emotional state when you make the dog like something to do when the dog understands that there is rules that there is boundaries there is concepts but at the same time, they flourish. And everybody says that they flourish, and everybody says that the dog is whatever, but then you watch the video, and it takes no more than 10 seconds to see a dog in total misery, 
and then you realize that it's just words. But that's not everywhere. It's right. a, I think we need to just continue to search and not give up and not scratch off something because I, you really, there is, there is excellence in every aspect of dog training and that's, that should be so interesting to everybody. It's mind blowing that it's not. That we actually yeah. kind of protect our own, so to speak, not to open that door. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, oh no, that doesn't work. That. Yeah. that doesn't yeah. work. Or, oh no, that's that's yeah. just like, yeah. Yeah. you're just torturing dogs. Yeah. Let's it's, come uh, in the middle. You, you got to kind of protect your political party, so to speak, right? <laughs> you know, or else you're, you're sort of being a traitor to your party. But yeah, and then that's, you know, you immediately, again, go on, you immediately see that Red Sox hat. If you're a Yankees fan, you auto, it just creates a visceral emotional response in the human, the trainer, about what that particular, if you see a person using a tool, you might see the dogs being very happy, but it's the tool that you see. It's so you know. funny you have this analogy because I have a, like we have a seminar coming up tomorrow with, with a friend of mine, um, sports seminar, and he's mm -hmm. the kind of guy that he would wear, his, he, he wears the baseball mm -hmm. caps and he would have, yeah. he has them all. And different day, it's a different hat. Yeah. Because he loves the sports. Yeah. Yeah. And he respects the teams. And there is sometimes yeah. a better team and there is sometimes a team that loses. And sometimes yeah. you root for this team and sometimes you root. But yeah. ultimately you're about the game. Yeah. And but you're loyal to your team, right? It's also I and I'm True. I'm realizing that we probably have listeners to this all over the world. So Red Sox Yankees may not make sense, but if let's use the World Cup just happened, like if everybody just came with their Argentinian <laughs> gear on, all right, that's gonna that's gonna immediately evoke some emotional Especially if responses. you're from Brazil. So, so <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate that the dog training community is the same in the sense of a lot of times the same of, of this clashing based on just surface value without digging into more curiosity. You know, you know what is interesting to me is that we, because we don't have this conversation, we start to rely on what science says. And yeah. depending yeah. which science you look at, like I, I can promise anyone that questions this, that there is science that says this or this equally, it depending which studies you start to listen to and which mm -hmm. references you start to dig into. Um, it, it's not a one, it, science doesn't really say, unless we have a, an objective when we make a study to come up with a certain outcome, which is not science anymore. But ultimately, <laughs> we on this planet at least, from the, the most primitive, single cell organism to us, dogs included, obviously. We are programmed, being evolution, being design, whatever we want to choose to, but we are programmed to respond, to s approach something good, something pleasurable, and avoid something dangerous or harmful. This is a fundamental law in our planet for good or bad. And to, to pick one of the two is just like, it's, it's not complete. I, it, there is always a better option than the other one. Sometimes there is equal options and when there is equal options, we should be able to choose the most dog friendly option. There is no, nobody should ever question that, right? Right, um, right. But, gosh, I, I love that we are talking this. Like I, I've been waiting, like I, I have invited so many people to, to try to, to convince them to talk to me and somehow they think that I'm gonna either be just angry and, and disrespectful <laughs> yeah. and, and what I, 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 don't, I don't know why, but they like, and I'm not gonna give the names, but it's like really, I have, I have approached so many people and 
it kind of goes to a certain place. Maybe we do a conversation and then we do a podcast and it falls true. Yeah. I think it's a it's the culture difficult. though. It's it's I blame it on the culture that we are experiencing right now. Is that that's what everybody's experience is. You try to jump into a conversation online with somebody and what are they met with? Often not even it's, it's the funny thing is it's not even directly from that person sometimes. It's from that person's followers. They jump into a thread. And so you think you kind of get this mindset, oh, okay, that's how all of these, you know, pers- these people from this other camp or other side of the politics are gonna behave towards me. So oh, I'm not gonna jump on a podcast. That's really sad again to think about that. And it's why I so strongly focus on that message of just being open, you know, like with my workshops, I don't, I never advertise this as a force free workshop this is a balanced workshop. I keep all that language out of it. And including when I even give my presentations, I don't use any of those terms because I want everybody to feel welcome because I know that there are some balanced trainers that attend and they're open to learning and I'm open to teaching if they're open to learning. Yeah. I mean, that's as simple as that. And it's sad that they would feel, and if some of them have come up to me and said, you know, I was a little nervous about coming. I wasn't sure if I was going to be like attacked. I'm kind of the outsider or these other things. I'm like, that's not how it is there at all. You're welcome. You can ask questions. And even if they ask questions that might indicate they use certain tools, I'm not going to attack them or, or do anything like that. I want them to feel welcome. And that's the unfortunate thing we're seeing again. That's why I can see where there's some hesitation to maybe even come onto your podcast is because of that. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the, the community right. and the, the politics and the atmosphere, which is sad, right? The culture of things. So, um, and going back to what you're talking about science too, right? We see the same phenomenon happen when um, there's miscommunications. And, and that's the tough thing about science too. It, it, it's not a requirement for dog trainers to be invested in learning from the different scientific lenses and even how to read a paper. I mean, right. <laughs> you look at the you know, people cherry picking papers or studies or, or articles sometimes as science, you know, you get an opinion piece sometimes, oh, look at what the science says. And you're like, well, this is just an op-ed in the New York Times or something. And they're using that as like their, their argument to bolster their arguments. So um, without, again, I, I don't know, you know, maybe it's just this, they don't want to seem like they don't know what they're talking about. Or they just want to continue arguing the point, but they sometimes are just actually hurting their credibility when they're taking, you know, somebody that is an academic or does know science. So Mon Gadbois is a perfect example. He gets sometimes criticized on his own threads just because he's talking like an ac- academic. Academics are the way they talk to each other and argue a point is very dry and it might seem very mean, but that's right. just how they communicate in that community. Right. It's never critical and like it's called name calling. It's just like, show me their, the, their data or is, you know, they, they ask questions like that, but that's just good curiosity. No, I, this is, yeah, as, you you're know. so right. Like you, like if you, if you make a paper, you should be able to stand up confidently and answer questions. And sometimes you may say, I don't know. And sometimes you can see that maybe you kind of went around this in the study or no, there is no study in, there is no perfect studies. We have to start there. There is, mm-hmm. there is just no question that it's very hard. And especially, especially in the dog kind of science, you know, it's, it's hard to get grants. It's hard to mm-hmm. even get volunteers. Sometimes you have, yeah. and then the difference between survey versus actual 50 dogs versus thousand yeah. dog study, mm-hmm. you know, they, they have different weight and we need to take that under consideration. Um, but that's with the science, but like, even when you think honor, just, just your normal pet honor, ultimately mm-hmm. what they want, they want a happy dog. And if they come for yeah. help, they need to see some results sooner or later. And hopefully sooner than when the dog is already eight, 10 years old, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because they, they will lose patience and they will give away the dog. And what happens is these pet owners start to bounce. They, they, okay, this is what's available. This is what I think it's really the best thing because that's my access. That's my algorithm that feeds me that kind of training. Mm-hmm. If it worked, great. If it didn't work, we go to the other side. And then we say, and somehow this worked. And now we say, well, all of this in the past is a bad thing to do regardless of which side yeah. we're taking. 
a, such a wrong uh, uh, a way to look at things. And we have to, as trainers, we, we need to start to have this common ground and, and, and look at things together. And just because whatever trainer was using a certain approach and that didn't work, we cannot blame the whole approach. We cannot blame the whole, you know, mm-hmm. you know where I'm going, right? I know exactly where you're going. Yeah. 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 It's the, again, it's, that's the issues when it's really the tools that, that are being used as such, you know, team markers, you know, they're, they're, they're like those logos, the Red Sox, the Argentinian logo, whatever you're right. talking about. It's unfortunately that that's the, what's happened in, in terms of the politics of the industry you, in, in the labels too, force free and balance has created this, this division. This is already uh, a bad between. idea. Yes. I, I agree with you. Yeah. This already puts you in a, in a corners, you know? Right. Yeah. Like it, it, it doesn't matter how brilliant, like if somebody's really in, entrenched in a certain camp, just putting that label on anybody it could be the most titled, uh, whatever, whatever awards and accolades you can give somebody. It doesn't matter then. It's all thrown out once yeah. you find out, oh, they're a balanced trainer. Oh, no, 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 I can't follow that or I can't explore any further. Oh, they're a force-free trainer. Oh, no, 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 like, I don't do any of that stuff. So uh, they're just, you know, they're just too extreme. And then so it puts this immediate wall up that stunts learning. And it's sad because there's so much you can learn from some brilliant trainers, you know, again. Here's the interesting thing, too. I'd love to get your your thoughts on this is that you travel a lot, right? You give of a course. lot of workshops and you, you, you meet a lot of people in a lot of different areas. And But the things that are interesting to me is when you go to conferences or you have those conversations after the workshop and you discover that really there's not as much of an extreme as people think. There's a lot of actual trainers that people think are balanced which are they're actually much more force free than you realize and the vice versa the people labeling as force free they're actually much more balanced than you realize and uh, if we were to again use those labels and have that particular picture in our mind of what that means but it's interesting if that's why i i really implore people to just like get off the social media just i mean spread the good message on social media but just have these conversations like you and i are having or go to these workshops go to conferences get them after and have the conversations after hours so the after much. hours are yeah. priceless so when you when you priceless. lose your car yeah. you have a drink yeah. you have a cigar mm-hmm. and you mingle with people and you talk mm-hmm. yeah. it's, it's the best you almost part. never see arguments the there right part. you never see, people don't start but arguing even well, when they do the time, even right? when they do yeah. it's a, a different level of a, it's actually intelligent argument with mm-hmm. respecting each other yeah, it, it's yeah. it's actually very productive arguments, mm-hmm. and um, I will tell you because I had you know, like my my whole way of training, and that that was early nineties, and I called it training without conflict, and it's it can be very misleading. Obviously, title training without conflict really. In a, on the surface, you would say, well, this is a force-free approach. So I would get a lot of times when I go to Europe, when, I, when mm-hmm. I'm outside the country, purely force-free people. And guess what? I'm like, no, it, this, this is, I'm, I'm sorry that kind of misled you, but guess what? I'm totally capable to keep you in a force free and help you if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And then we stay there. But then what happens is interesting because then there is the curiosity of human nature and it's like, well, but what would Mm -hmm. you do? Not that I want to happen with my dog, but what would you do? And now we are talking. And then you take what you want to take. Yeah. And then they then they can speak intelligently about why they may not use Correctly. it. Correctly, and you cannot like right? you you don't yeah. have to. Ultimately, it's somebody's choice to, you know, and for for the most part, and again, I, I mean, you you obviously understand that I, I I'm, I I I, I have no restrictions of ideologies. I I'm. A, I'm a dog trainer. I, I don't put myself in any, any place. 
I, I train dogs and I try to do the best I can for every single dog and person, whatever that is. Um, and sometimes there is moments just like I'm sure you have to where the cost and benefit is like, it, it's just not worth it. Like we were going in a place where we should never go. So what do you want to do? When, when this happens, it's very interesting. And it's not, like the whole thing about my training without conflict. Sometimes I get it from both sides. And, and it's really what I, what it is, is that I take the conflict away. I think I, I tend, try my best to have an approach to where the dog understands what I want them to do. And they're never put in this position that they're in no man's land and, and start to flee or fight or, or you know, just because they, they just have no idea what's happening. And this is the conflict free that I'm talking about. Um, but uh, as I said, like we, you know, we have a bad idea when we talk about, even when we say today negative reinforcement, it, it has become just as, I mean, it, it's together with positive punishment. It's a bad idea in, in some, in society period, not, not even dog training. But negative reinforcement is like, think of all the games, just think of any, any game that's cool there is an element of a negative reinforcement. Dogs playing, what, what do they do? It's all negative reinforcement. It's like you avoid <laughs> an escape and you win or lose yeah. and it's cool, you know? You play hot hands with a kid and sometimes you lose, sometimes you win and it actually you wanna play again when it's done right, when there is a way out, when it's clearly way out, yeah. you actually grow up and you love it. Um, and I, I don't even know where I was going with this, but um, <laughs> it's just this labeling of everything to, to, it's like, okay, no, this is, this is a bad idea. And, or, so, so from the force free side, it will, okay, this is a bad idea. From the balance or traditional term, it's like, well, this is not gonna work or that's gonna take 10 years. It's like, but how about maybe there is something in between in both? There is, for sure there is, you know, let's look at that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what can happen, like the damage that can occur when a certain, let's use negative reinforcement, for instance, comes up in the community, in the conversations that swirl around it. Sometimes you have a, a, a few parties in that argument that are really hammering the points home about how it's a bad or a good thing, depending on what it is. And they bring in all these studies and all these things to bolster their point, which may or may not be accurate sometimes in terms of application to that to that argument. And then it takes a long time to fix to, to kind of repair that damage, you know, like the term negative reinforcement. It got lumped into, oh, you know, the force, you know, the force free trainers were saying, oh, the e collar trainers are using negative reinforcement, you know, and applying the stem yeah. and then removing it. And then and then they started going on and on, but they forget that they are also using it in many applications without even realizing it. And so it got this four letter word sort of, right? And became a True. bad thing. And so it either got, didn't get talked about or it got talked about in there in a one, in just one lane. Okay. It's always bad. It's never a good thing uh, without realizing that it happens quite often and not think talking about those examples or having this conversation. So I think, uh, you know, I guess my thought process there is it's who's, who's discussing it and, you know, which conversations we should be listening to when we have, um, when we're sort of debating a topic like negative reinforcement, we need s it, the problem with social media is you get the, the conversation gets so muddy. And so, yes. And there um, is the almost difficult for new people to follow that they're going to be like, Oh, this is just a headache. So I'm just going to latch on to what makes most sense to me. And sometimes it's the false um, issue or the false, yeah, you, you end um, up taking a side presentation of it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, exactly. And then, then that's what causes damage. It takes a long time to repair that. Look at dominance, right? Look at the word dominance and how long that's been a bad word. Um, and negative reinforcement similarly, you know, uh, and, and 
it's not to say we shouldn't be educated about what to know about the potential issues with negative reinforcement in some contexts, but it's not always this bad four letter word right. that we can't talk about. And right? not to mention so, that even, I don't know what was it like in the, the 70s or whatever, there was already a, a, a movement where you, you, you absolutely can look at negative and positive reinforcement as a one thing and you, you, you know, you shouldn't, uh, um, uh, um, you know, like if, if if there is negative, there is positive. Automatically, you, you will find it on the other yeah. side. You know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. That was <laughs> but yeah. when when something, it, I think it's the words and it's the lack of under, like trainers not mm -hmm. not not having enough courage and possibly not having enough education to where they just stick to the words and the narrative and the mantras on each side. Yeah. It's like, okay, no, we are training this way and this way. But then you look at the dog and it's like, okay, but it's, it, it's everything that you say, it's not what I see. So I, I will be yeah. interested in, in the same approach, but with somebody that has mm -hmm. the mastery and the skill to show me, and I know that it exists. Yeah, it's and you can't fault the younger trainers these days. You know, I, I never blame them for just not, uh, you know, understanding it fully or uh, really maybe they have the false impressions because it's where they're getting their information right. from and they're digesting that. And, you know, you really these days have to be a good consumer of information and know how to uh, separate the good stuff from the bad stuff. And, and, and that's difficult, right? Because there's so much influence in our messaging and we have much more short attention spans for the messaging we're getting uh, through social media or really any learning aspect. It's much more uh, micro right. rather than macro. And I so, will put you. Uh, yeah, I never fault younger trainers. You know, you, you help steer them. And you, you, it's better to just give them the, the tools to like know how to di dissect and really digest information and know what we need to out and what we need to keep and uh, where to get good information from and how to you know um to seek out good sources um to look at the science yep. that's available to us and i don't want to that's a skill yes, in itself no. right so a lot there's a lot of that the trainers new, new trainers have to put on their plate at first right and it makes it more difficult than probably when you and i first started yes where it was, it was just very books, difficult for us, us right? but i it's just as difficult for them because they have too much now and and it's not easy to <laughs> and the, the short attention span and 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 the rush yeah. for the next yeah. better thing and and yeah, yeah it's a challenging yeah. environment for sure i will say though i will give the young generation credit they have access to information that at, at their fingertips and if they are good consumers of information they can become a very very knowledgeable and insightful in, in a very short time. I see it, and I saw it actually in other countries. You know, when I went to, I gave a workshop in Brazil uh, last year, or mm -hmm. actually earlier this year, and I got oh. COVID there. That's how I remember it was earlier this year. And, uh, the, but the training, uh, the, the knowledge of the trainers there blew me away. You know, they knew about concepts that, um, that I didn't think that they would have heard of, and they knew about those things and, and the terminology. I was just blown away by their the level of knowledge. And it's because of their access to information now. Everything's online where yes. previously, you know, even 10 years ago, they would have had to order books and had them sent over to Brazil and all this stuff. So it's it's impressive, the younger generation, their their knowledge. But again, the, the key is how to how to really dissect and digest proper information, have critical thought. That's another big part that's um, really important is to really be able to analyze what are you seeing? You know, what are you reading? What's really happening here and why is it happening this way? Uh, and are you curious enough to ask further questions in a nice and right. kind way, right? Without attacking anybody. I think that's uh, that right there says a lot about a lot of these younger trainers. If they can do that, then they're going to be very successful. And we are, of course, seeing that in, in some of these younger trainers, a lot of talented, knowledgeable, brilliant trainers, which is For exciting. Sure. It's For exciting, sure. but it's scary no, at the no. same time. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I... It, it, we have to help them to not to keep them in our bubble. We have to we have to allow them to learn, like we really have yeah. to allow them yeah. to learn, or they they learn on their own. I think um, 
I mean, you know, ultimately we're gonna talk some some level about electric colors or shock colors and and like the the way I feel about banning of the colors and I I'm I'm from Europe I I grew up there and I you know that's where my dog training started I I was in Bulgaria originally then I moved to Belgium for a bunch of years and eventually to San Francisco um and so so I and I go all the time and I know I I just know that banning something doesn't work it makes you feel good that you do it but it ultimately doesn't work and it's not just for electric color i think it's for everything that gets banned it doesn't go away if it's working the problem that i see and and it's not even a speculation on an argument just because it's banned it doesn't go away it never goes away if if it can work yeah and the biggest problem that happens is people start to hide there is not enough education and they start to do bad things just because they don't know better because now it's hidden now it's taboo but somehow again your subconscious is like okay well there there is something about it that it's clearly working and i'm still feeling the need to do it because it works better than something else unless we can show that that's not the case and i think this is what we we are failing because in certain areas i am 100% in agreement that w- we have to show and everybody will accept that yeah there is a better way and we don't need it perfectly no like we will not need to ban it but then there is the yeah. times when that yeah. comes and Europe is it's the most strange place in the world right now because everybody that used electric colors and I promise you this because I I I am I'm in all sorts of circles of dog training from from animal shelters to pet training to search and rescue military like like everything and I am 100% that anybody that did it and that worked for them and wasn't shown a better way they're continuing to do it they just hide including army and yeah. police yeah. which is you know that the people that have to uh uh um you know uh um control the and regulate the laws mm-hmm. they actually have to hide because we have failed to give them mm-hmm. it's one thing to say well science says and and or avsb or whatever the, the it's like okay no there is a better way but if we if we cannot show the better way this is a problem and this is you know like i i am all for it show show let's go the better way um because it's a very dangerous road to like i see it all the time in europe um there is there is just a, a very uh, it's it's underground and it's all the same nothing has changed it's just you cannot there is nothing you can mm-hmm. do like no matter how many laws you you you, you pass um when you ban something what ends up missing is the education to do it better or to like in my seminars most of the time i i take remote control away from people because they just they, they're trigger happy it's like it's just knock it off that's not dog training like it it doesn't it, it just from anywhere you want to look at it that's not dog training and it doesn't like like look at your dog this the reason you're here mm. and you need help from me is because of the things you're doing to your dog let's take this away and and see and I, i will show you a better way and when i show a better way i cannot force them to use the electric collar anymore i think this is the the right approach to to be taken not not by legislation not by 
uh, um, what science says. We, we need to be very proactive yeah. and demonstrate that there is a better way. And sometimes there is, sometimes maybe there yeah. isn't. But not everything good is that good and not everything bad is that bad. Yeah. So my curiosity, of course, which is good in this conversation is, and I don't think I, this has ever been asked <laughs> or anywhere that I've seen is though, what do you do or what is your messaging or your approach to when you have trainers that are using e-collars, but are doing it much differently than you and doing it in a way that you wouldn't. And that could be construed as, you know, damaging yeah. or, you know, abusive or any of those characteristic words you might see in the, the conversations online. How does that resonate with you as somebody that, you know, feels that very proficient and not going to be doing those things? Clearly you're very experienced with them. What do you, what do you do as yourself? And then also as the community, other trainers that are like yourself that are yeah. using them not in the way that you're seeing it. And then that's what much of the either general public or the trainers that aren't using those are going to attack and go after and say, see, I told you so. Like, what is your message? If, if I understand how the do you question respond to that? Right? Like I, I, I'm in constant war with people that hold remote controls. Uh, I, there is, mm. you know, like, um, in, in this environment, there is a lot of, very well-known trainers that uh, I openly disagree with. Um, when we when we look at a dog, if the dog is stressed, if the dog is not doing things with you because of doing things with you, because of the enjoyment. I think it's a it's a problem, and the the biggest problem is the the world salad that is used and 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 it's sold as okay. Well, this is the spirit, and this is whatever, and and mm -hmm. I you know so many people or whatever. Ultimately, that's not the case. When when somebody needs help. Trainers most most of the trainers recognize it, that they need help, and they they search for help. And um, it really comes down to understanding, learning. You know, just just learning concepts. Like I was gonna say, animal learning, but it's just learning concepts, motivation, emotions. Um, all reinforcements, all punishments, genetic predisposition, pairing a behavior with an emotion, making the dog want to do something, understanding that your dog's not gonna do, just like I'm not gonna be as good in basketball as Michael Jordan was ever, no matter uh, what you're gonna do to me. And, and you know, pick your battle, see what you want to wear and understand. Like, like one of the biggest things is, and this also goes when I do aggression stuff, it's like understand what I call it home base. What is the home base of the dog? Like, like how we talk of, you know, the big five in, in humans. Um, it's like you, you go to an ATM machine and it's dark at night and somebody taps you on the shoulder one person will turn around and punch his grandma without knowing and apologize. Somebody's gonna run, somebody's gonna freeze, you're gonna have different, and, and this is what I mean by home base. And when you try to go against that, it never can be productive. But the, the person that's gonna punch his grandma, you know, grandma can say, hello, son, it's me. End of story, right? A lot of aggression problems can be just done like this. Like I had a, um, just two days ago, I had to go to, to a client and the problems that they were having, of course, the dog 
they don't have too many visitors, the dog comes at the door barking and whatever. Yeah, we can, we can hammer them very easy and we can stop it. We s- absolutely can stop it. What do we do? What, what was accomplished? Nothing. The dog, we actually reconfirm to the dog that these people are bad. Instead of trying to change their perception and, and, yeah. and have them look forward to somebody coming, which is very easy to do once you start thinking this way. I'm sure you're using strategies like this. Yeah. That same dog, so we went and, and of course there is also food and play and, and a lot of time play like most people, I, you know, most people don't think of, like I'm very big on play is my specialty. If I have to say if there is a, something that I'm really, really understanding very well, it, that that would be play. Um, so when you compare food versus play, Play can win every day and very quickly because you're not a food source, you're, you're a playmate. And when two dogs meet, the dog, the one dog play bows and in that same instant, everything is clear. My intentions are clear. And this is what the problem is with a lot of uh, 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 pet owners and, and dogs. It's like that very, it's one of the most difficult things, I think, to, uh, um, for somebody, being a dog, being a person, to, to understand in that very instance, what is someone else's intention in that moment. And if we master that, and there is so many cool ways to do it, the problems are not there no more. But Yes, we can suppress it, or yes, we can throw food all over the floor. We, there, there is ways, and some will work, some will not, but there is some better and some are not better. And depending on the, you know, the case to case, um, we, we need to look at that. But anyway, that dog that I'm telling you, it's, it's like a, some mix, I don't know, looks like some mixed shepherd dog. And was very, very, very cool dog, and I'm sure, the people that I'm talking about, they, they probably will listen to this. Um, the, the other issue the dog has is every time the, the husband goes on the bed and tries to hug the dog, the dog growls and maybe snaps, but never really bit him and jumps away. Mm-hmm. So it's the easiest thing. It's like, just announce yourself. Hey, I'm coming to the bed. I'm going to touch you. There is no surprise. And, and again, it's this like understanding the home base of the dog to begin with puts you in a position where you can actually can make the dog trust you and not get surprised and not get to react in the way he's genetically programmed to react in that situation. Um, so, yeah, I, I have no idea. I <laughs> <laughs> a lot, lots of uh, to read in between the lines there too. Um, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I think we we're, we're talking about the e collar, you know, conundrum, um, and it's the banning of it. For some and, reason, for people to be like, okay, know. let's let's just stop him. Yeah. And and some one of the things where I mean, you know, I have a school for dog trainers, and and mm-hmm. some of the most important lessons is. You can stop dogs. I can teach you how to stop dogs. When the dog goes back home, or if it's in home lessons, and they stop suppressing, little by little, that behavior comes back. Mm -hmm. And when that behavior comes back a few times, now the whole random schedule of reinforcement puts it in a very special place. And at this moment, we have a very difficult situation only because we have failed to change the dog's perception of that environment and and i always will insist that yes sometimes we need to stop it but it should never be the end we need to change perception that's Mm -hmm. that's what 
when we're talking about behavior problems, that's what it is. Yeah. And when we cannot change perception, then we need to look at managing. Management is not hard. It just needs to be accepted when it's explained well. Because e e even with management, sometimes we think as Dr. Anderson, I'm sure you have this. Sometimes we're talking, yeah, management. Let's, mm -hmm. This is a case where we're not going to be able to convince them otherwise. Let's just manage it. Yep. But with the long-term management, a lot of times the dog starts to loosen up its guard and starts to be like, you know what? I'm gonna try a little bit, I'm gonna test a little, maybe. And it starts to grow and it starts to deal with the situation and it starts to improve instead of constantly poking on, see, this is your problem, this is your problem. And then it just makes it worse instead of improving. It's a big, yeah. big issue with, with um, so some, some dog trainers have big problems with that. Yeah. It yeah, I mean, it, it shows, um, again, the messaging has to be delivered well, and then the education has to be there to recognize when that's a problem, right? Because um, the root of, root of all behavior problems is, is it's usually a lack of something the dog's not getting, or it's, you know, we're not meeting that dog's needs, and or the dog is just simply scared of something in the environment, or it's something that's causing that, you know, the dog to feel threatened. Uh, and if we don't change that, we can suppress it all day long, right? But it's if we don't change how the dog feels about it from an emotional level, you never really get get to the root of the problem. You never change it, and that goes for whatever tool you're using, right? Uh, but if we when would, like, back if, to the e collar conundrum, is that we, we when when you see it used improperly, it can actually do what we don't want to do, which is you know pair more negatives with it or not achieve the outcome we're trying to do, is to help the dog feel better around that particular situation. If so. we have this in person, we would be cheering right now. <laughs> yeah. Like it's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. How about like like in my experience of all all those years, I really feel that one of the one of the problems is that a lot of the the dogs with problems being reactivity, aggression, like I actually don't like the word the reactivity, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> you and I both. <laughs> another reason to cheers. Yeah. yeah. But but most of the dogs they just need some some just basic rules and basic just say hey, this is this is how the world works. This is you know, just, just some basic training. Whichever way you wanna take that basic training. But you don't have to as I was saying, like, no, you don't go on the bed. No, you're going to do sit, stay for 30 seconds yeah. or two minutes before I let you eat or I go first at the door and mm -hmm. all this. Like, a lot of the problems that the majority of what pet owners think it's a problem, it's quite easy if it's tapped in early on mm -hmm. to just get some understanding that the dog is a dog and this is what we can do to make us function and work and play and live together. And the problems are gone. Of course we have serious cases, but they are not that many. Right. They're not that many. If there were that many, people would not own dogs. There is, there is selection, there is breeding, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how do you feel? I mean, do you think similarly or? Yeah, I think it's, I, I think, thankfully, again, another thing that it used to be dog trainers were just known for, let's teach sit, down, stay, come, heal, walk, you know, all those typical commands that we would teach them. But I think it's shifting now a little bit more again in a, in a positive direction. Let's, let's understand what this dog needs. Let's understand what we as humans have created here and, and breeding and genetics. Let's understand the different roles. If we're going to take a livestock guardian dog and put them in an apartment in New York City, you're going to have probably problems where it's not going to adapt well to that environment. So for, for many pet owners, I'm glad we're seeing like understanding of, you know, hey, it's really not such a big deal if my dog gets up on the bed or gets on the couch or, you know, barks at the door <laughs> to let me know somebody's there. Those are normal things to expect from a dog. It's it's because we're we're faced with the responsibilities. Humans, we're bringing these animals into our environments, in our culture, 
a little microculture sometimes and sometimes they're from these completely different worlds and we we lose sight of that expectations and i and that's one big part of the messaging i'd love to see more in the public is like if you get a dog from a rescue let's try to find out what the environment was like for that dog for maybe the mm-hmm. first year or two and what we're bringing them to and the amount of management that we've just put on that dog that might have had much more freedom earlier on and we're seeing some behavior issues in the problem in the home. No wonder why, because we've, we're taking them out of and putting them in such a foreign situation, which may not seem foreign to us because we're human and a house is a house, regardless in our mind of where you put it. But for the dog, it is completely different in many cases. And so I think educating that part first before the sit down, stay, come, you know, heal right. should come first and understanding the dog's needs and what's normal for behavior for that particular dog, that breed, the where we got the dog from, the dog's age, all of those characteristics, first and foremost, then layer in the other stuff to help you solve what's usually, as you mentioned, a very straightforward issue. Do we have extreme cases? Of course, but fortunately, like you said, they're far and few between. And if you do, even in those cases, if you do things well with with understanding that dog's needs and adapting that dog to the new environment we just put them in then you're going to see results regardless so um yeah and i think i think similar similar message of what you just what you said there but finding outlets also focus on finding an outlet for for this dog to do something Mm -hmm. they you know they're just living thing they they're like us we need a purpose you don't you life without meaning it's it's, yeah. it's not nothing like you know then yeah. then you then you start doing dumb things then you go into drugs or you just yeah. do bad things yeah. and it's it's normal because you, yeah. you just there is no no meaning in your life you have nothing yeah. to look forward to yeah also i think in a, in another way we we tend to always blame the dog but the dog is stuck with us in the house yeah. with this family and that family like if if a pack in in you know stray dogs you know if things are not right they either gonna straighten out or they're gonna break the pack and they're gonna move away yeah. and, and yeah. in our situations we're like no we're gonna fix it it's like well no you have a for lack of better word a, a very crazy family that the dog is just doesn't know how to function there there is just no you know and and we try to fix the dog when mm-hmm. the dog is not the problem in that situation yeah it's our expectations as humans right yeah. and, and, and like look, let's look at maladaptive behaviors you know you see a dog doing something that just is not normal behavior and then we blame the dog oh we've just got a crazy dog but you, you know again going back to this you know the 750 million or so dogs that aren't owned by anybody you don't see the maladaptive behaviors there you don't see spinning tail chasing shadow chasing compulsive behaviors stereotypic behaviors you don't see hardly any of that and rare occasions you do but it's it's so uncommon because they're in natural normal environments living behaviorally very happy most of the time and then we we have these weird expectations. Don't ever bark at the door. Don't ever bark at that window at somebody going by the house where you've done that for <laughs> you and all of your ancestors and all of your brothers and sisters and cousins are doing the exact same thing anywhere else on the planet. And now we don't want that. And we're going to do something awful to the dog, like punish them or don't squirt sniff them. On or... the street. Don't pee on the tree. Don't. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't. Don't, don't like... pee on that tree. Just pee on that tree. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we agree on that, that we just have on real unrealistic expectations sometimes and that's you know again our job as trainers um it's just to continue that helping clients understand that message of you know the, this is let's focus on what your dog needs first and understanding your dog then i'll teach you all the other stuff to to maybe solve the dog's problem of jumping up on grandma when they come right. over you know so tell me a little bit about the school or is is it a school or is it a just it's uh, so i have um how, how yeah I guess I would call it a school. Um, you know, I have uh, an online course for for trainers working, looking to f- focus on aggression, right? So it's anybody that want to work, and it's not. Um, I don't have any prerequisites. I have some pet owners come through, so I've never, I've never 
uh, wanted to have something where people are certified to work aggression cases. It's just more of um educational Regional piece, really. So teaching our, others, uh, yeah, the really well, big focus is staying safe to, you know, you see a lot of trainers getting bitten and doing silly things that compromise their safety or other safety. So a big part of the course is on that, but just, just, just helping dogs with aggression issues, you know, whether it's a pet owner or all the way on up to, you know, really well-known trainer, everybody's kind of taking the course and, and taking what they need for what, what they want to fill in gaps in their knowledge. So it's meant, it's really designed for that. So I don't know, I guess you would call it a school, but not necessarily designed as that. Although I do have a mentor component where I um, help trainers work through different cases, but so. And you also collaborate yeah. with quite a few trainers, which is very cool. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't, I'm not necessarily even trainers. I mean, there is just a, a, quite a bit of a range of, of people you're collaborating with. And that's, that's yeah, I think, um, again, another thing, I, you know, I, I want to bring in the messages because there's some, there's, as you know, there's sometimes you don't know about somebody and they're a hidden gem, right? But they have incredibly uh, insightful information about dog aggression or just, you know, it doesn't have to be just, you know, dogs. It could be neuroscience or applied ethology or different lenses that we can help use to help us understand dog behavior much more. So I, I that's, uh, you know, I learn a lot, you know, I, on my podcast, I've had a lot of different guests from different backgrounds, but it's, it's an educational tool for me. So I'm kind of <laughs> self-serving in that way. But um, yeah, I love collaborating with others. I don't, I, the worst thing that can happen to the industry is to be to hide you know and you know how this was 20 years ago i was like oh no i'm not gonna tell you my secret oh no that's proprietary to me where now we're seeing the opposite of course is the more you can spread information and give value to people is, is how you get uh more well known and get the message out there but i i, I love collaborating with others and I, I also love providing that stage for maybe somebody that isn't as well known to to be able to 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 share their knowledge or talk about their message that maybe they weren't given the opportunity before. So I actually recently just put out a call for um, speakers, writers, uh, podcast guests, webinar presenters, um, all, all to be done through my platform to just, again, if maybe you, you never know, you get discovered. So I, I've got about like 150 different applications I've got to comb through at the moment. Um, but it's all you know, people from around the world, some you would definitely know if you, you heard their names with others, you, you would probably never have heard of them, but they've got really interesting things to talk about. So, um, yeah, collaboration is the name of the game. It's always sure. been for me because it just, it helps to spread more information where, um, you know, needs to be talked about sometimes more and sometimes there's some really new ideas. So yes. yeah, it's been, yeah, been very, yes. a great, great fortunate opportunity for me. The podcast, like, Sometimes I, I mean, I, I, you know, like I, as I said, like I, I just cannot stop learning and, and it's just what I do. Some people watch, you know, TV, some people yeah. stay on YouTube. I, I learning and, and, you know, th this is what's interesting me. So there is times when I listen to some of even like your podcast, I'm like, man, I wish I can talk to this person too. Like yeah. I have some questions and whatever, but I know that it's very difficult to convince somebody to talk to me. Maybe this can change. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's I hope it does open some doors. I'm sure yeah. it will. Actually, I mean, I think this is this is what has uh, I've seen it actually happen over and over. Where uh, you know, if I um, talk to somebody that maybe somebody's avoiding, um, it just lends. You have had some brilliant conversation to where I'm like, man, I, 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 I wished to be part of this conversation. You know. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just like, because it's, it's interesting. That's, you know. Yeah. 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 I've, yeah. Like Simone Gadbois, very interesting guest to have on. I know you had him on. And, uh, I did. I did. You I could know. talk to him for days. I mean, he's yes. just. Brilliant. We were, we had a very good conversation. Um, I think, I think he kind of, at some point in the conversation, he, I, I didn't want to, I did not want to, like with you, I'm very open. I'm, uh, and I hope you you see I'm very respectful, but I'm I, I'm asking the questions that are interesting to me, so we can have this yeah. conversation. Yeah. Like with him, I did not feel that I can put him in a situation like this because he, he he would feel uh, not at ease. And and at the end, somehow, uh, um, the conversations just kind of took direction towards you know using 
uh, all sorts of negative reinforcement and punishment or mm-hmm. electric collar, I can't remember. And, and then we kind of abruptly had to stop it. And I understand sometimes when you, when you cannot talk about it and when you feel that you mm-hmm. don't want to talk about it, it's nothing wrong with that, you know? Like, like I can ask you a question and you can say, well, it's just, I have yeah. an opinion, but I don't, you know, it's okay, I respect that. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I certainly don't want to speak for Simone, but I can totally understand the dynamic that might be occurring there because he's no stranger to being a victim of, uh, you know, the attacks on social media. I've seen it happen on his Facebook wall, and it's just because he's an academic, like I said before. He, he says he speaks his mind in a certain way, and he's not arguing. If you read, read what he's saying, he's actually not being critical. He's not calling anybody names. He's not being disrespectful. It's just that it comes across that way. In, in to some people so he gets attacked and he gets called insensitive and all these other names so i can see where he that what what happens is not just to simone but everybody else i know that it has had these dealings on on it, it creates this wall so yeah. you don't feel comfortable speaking to somebody that might be maybe outside your camp or right. you're a little bit defensive or you're a little bit oh where's that question going are and they trying to say in a public forum like yeah. this it can be it can yeah. definitely be and, exactly but yeah. it's a it's a tough especially like you know if you're a etologist or, or evolutionary psychology you know like you yeah in in one side you have you know what you need to answer but at the same time a quick answer is gonna lead to a lot of questions and actually problems yeah. because yeah. It, it cannot end there and it's mm-hmm. uh, these are the difficult moments of of you know and and that's how it is it's, it's totally okay i had a very good time with him like i yeah. i yeah. actually plan to invite him uh, on another conversations because um, you know we had some very interesting common topics to talk about yeah. he's super intelligent and and yeah. um again the the etology aspect the mm-hmm. the notes work and all the stuff like a lot of commonalities and i think i think this is our this should be our goal to find commonalities first yeah and and then break down and then okay well we can disagree it's okay to disagree yeah absolutely um but yeah that was a um i guess how how much of electric color you've done in the past if any like what what is your like um, I've had again, like if you don't feel comfortable. I'm no, no, I, I'm always open and honest with this and my experience with it. Um, I've been to some good. Um, I, I don't want to call out names. I, sure. I tend to hesitate, but I've been to some good ones and some bad workshops. <laughs> there's some. There's a well-known franchise uh, that um, maybe is using e-college differently than some other e-college trainers. But mm-hmm. this is going back about 15 years ago now, so the technology then was a little different as well. So um, my experience is rudimentary, if I was to put any kind of term on it. I'm certainly no expert, although I do understand how they work. And I've kept up on the advances and, and what people are doing with them now versus 15 years ago. So it's definitely different. It's evolved. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my experience with them. And I, will, uh, uh, I never try to hide the fact that I use them, definitely use them. Um, use them extensively, you know, Simone when I was more also, of a traditional trainer. He said you know. that he did use it and he said that, um, you know, it didn't work for him yeah. and, and that's totally okay. And it's, yeah. you know, um, for, for me, they worked, <laughs> I mean, they worked well in a lot of circumstances. Um, but this is when I was taking on all kinds of cases. You know, I wasn't just taking aggression cases. Mm-hmm. Um, the pattern that I saw when I started shifting towards, um, you know, other methods. So I was, I was almost strictly e-collars, prong collars, uh, not so much choke chains. There was even 15 years yeah. ago, were falling out of favor. Um, so like the ball hard collar, I don't know if you remember yeah. those, yeah. So, yeah. so those limited slip collars. Um, I so that's what that was sort of so far back yeah. with choke chains yeah. to where yeah. what was her name? Barbara Woodhouse. Yeah. Oh yeah. Walkies. Way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Way back. You know. Um, yeah, you have to write a history book someday on training. I'm sure you're with going back 40 years. You really have seen quite a bit of change, especially, the, especially yeah. from growing up, growing up in Eastern Europe, which really yeah, the, yeah, the whole yeah, Russian I mean, influence of, of, a very different um, approach and moving to Belgium, moving to San yeah. Francisco. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, and then like, and then like, touring around and giving yes, workshops. Yes, I mean, you so definitely have soaked up, I'm sure, a lot of dog training culture that probably not many people have seen in the experience of the the change in the politics and the community and the culture of everything. It's it's you know, I, I know I've seen on twenty, sides. but forty years that's that's a lot of of exposure to different yeah. changes. So. Fortunately yeah. and unfortunately, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. A long time so, so I, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I ended up shifting more towards what I'm doing now because of I saw the effects of with aggression cases, especially. Yeah. Um, and the issue I was seeing is when you have somebody that doesn't know what they're doing with those tools or is using it poorly, the, the fallout, the side effects, as they would call it. And um, so I, you know, I sh shifted more towards, you know, of course, the methods I'm using now, which is using positive reinforcement or classical counter conditioning, typical strategies, and uh, seeing that it's hard, it, you can screw those things up as well. It's just harder to. So in the hands of somebody that's newer to training or your client, it's going to be harder for them to screw up their dog or do something uh, awful. It's not to say they can't. You can certainly use sure. food coercively. You can use food the wrong way. It's just there's less of a chance of it. So um and food you know. just i mean positive reinforcement it, and there's yeah. you know like and again just just i i don't even know if it's, it's worth going there but there there is a big you know there there, there are issues with positive reinforcement some of the mm -hmm. issues are um you know when we when we begin to reinforce everything we lose the in in, uh, I cannot say this word. I never can say the intrins intrinsic. Intrinsic, yeah, the internal yeah. Right. aspect you of know. it. Because ultimately, this is the cool thing in dog training that we should look into is how do you, okay, use your reinforcements, all reinforcement, use your punishment, all punishment, but look forward to how can you make the behaviors themselves reinforcing and joyful to to be performed yeah because then then this is a, a next level of interaction yeah that the dog actually looks forward to and you look forward yeah. to and these are just your stepping blocks to get there that's the ultimate goal right there. that's that's the ultimate goal when you're working especially in aggression you want to change how that dog feels about the particular situation they're in in the first place and if you do that where they're looking forward to that situation you've solved your problem yes. because there's no reason for the dog to display aggression if they're feeling good about the thing it's it's really that simple and it's unfortunately hard to explain to to some folks that are just stuck on you know i gotta stop this behavior well let's talk about how your dog's feeling in the situation that's how you fix the issue. Um, so, Let's yeah, and, and, and I love, you know, play is, uh, you know, oh, I love that you mentioned that and um, because that's such an important aspect too of the, the work that we're doing that isn't talked about enough. It, it gets talked about, but not enough. You know, I think it's going with positive reinforcement and like the focus on food all the time. Play gets sidestep and play is so powerful when it comes to aggression cases, as we know. Yes. You know, it's hard. The dogs don't play and yes. be fearful of something at the same time yes. that they want to bite, right? Yes. It's, it's either or, whereas do some dogs will eat and be fearful of something at the same time. So play is a great barometer, but that's a perfect example of, hey, are you looking forward to this? You're going to tell me because you're playing with me. So now I know I've done the right job. I've set things up well as a trainer. I've managed things well. I've created the right environment. And now you're playing. Um, it's working. So that's... You know, it's such and a beautiful when, barometer. When too. you are able to play, you're yeah. accomplishing, you're accomplishing so so much more because, you know, for for, and I'm talking for more interactive play with toys because yeah, you, when you when you this is my my some of my concepts, you know, like when you, and any game, think of any human game, any 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 play, has rules. Otherwise, there is no play, right? Yeah. And when the rules are broken, there is consequences. And to maintain play, you have to follow the rules. You're always going to try to bend the rules. You're always going to try to break the rules. But there's going to be always consequences. And that's the beauty of the game. And next thing you know, just by playing certain games in a certain way, 
you're accomplishing far more than any basic obedience training because you're teaching very friendly interaction, something that comes very naturally. And this is a, mm-hmm. a, a big problem with, with the industry. Even, even some of the marine world trainers, you know, they like teaching, teaching play to reinforce it with food to play. When, when not understanding that play is a primary reinforcer. Like you go to Jan mm-hmm. Panskep and, and all his rat stuff and like, well, w- now we know that play is an innate system. It's not mm-hmm. a, like you don't need to give a treat to convince a dog yeah. to play. It's harder to convince a dog to play in some cases, but if you are accomplish that, both of you are achieving something special yeah and it's just so beautiful um yeah i'm i'm like it's one of my obsession play like like you can have like the way i divide games it's also competitive and non-competitive games and i'm talking toys we of course can rough house and there is that kind of games but they're they're limited simply because we have a thin skin and then we tell the dog how hard he can go but the dogs want to go hard so when we have a toy in between as long as we understand that the toy is the object that we play together with it's not it it doesn't have a, a different meaning um then then play is a you know like like you can play competitive games of, of, you know, possession games, what I call it. Mm-hmm. And, and you, can, you can make a very shy, insecure dog grow confidence. Yeah. Like, we, like we do it all the time. Or you can have an aggressive dog that through games, you teach them boundaries and rules and, and, and you no, know, this is... Um, it's to me it's one of the most interesting and powerful ways to to interact um i'm obsessed with it <laughs> like I, I, clearly I, yeah yeah i can, I can <laughs> just go off on this forever yeah. but you know what i have in mind is how about we do electric color and we take the opposite sides like i will like you will tell me why electric color is good and and if you if you want to play and I will tell you the opposite. I will take the side of the force free and take the side where it's a it's mm-hmm. a bad idea to use electric color. Like, how would you? In the context of play um, or no, no, just oh, just yeah. in in dog training in general, mm-hmm. using electric color. Um, if you would. bring the good side of why electric color may have a place in training mm. that's a good question because of my it my thought process has thing. evolved so right. it, this would be a question it depends on when in my journey you've asked me so at one time i would have been totally yeah so 15 years ago i've been all oh, i could i could give you 100 reasons and then it got it shifted to where i became this really vehement force you know again those, yep. that term force free trainer i was like oh no don't even use that word around me to now where i haven't taken it off the t- table completely where i'm saying there's a potential i just don't know yet what it is other than potentially something where it's dangerous where you can't have any kind of where you can't be in the picture with a dog meaning they don't know you're there and it needs to be an environmental punisher for the dog versus you being associated with you. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a a livestock guardian dog on a farm that is uh, purchased, you know, obviously for livestock guardian duty. So not necessarily a pet dog, but just, you know, a farmer that has a livestock guardian dog protecting the flock. Okay. So the dog's doing its job, but it's also has this behavior where it's learned to bite at the sheep's legs it's got this odd behavior where it's like all right i'm biting at the sheep's fur and the farmer's getting mad and says okay i need you to stop this problem because i it's a it's affecting my livelihood the dog the dog is damaging my product my my sheep right and so how do you stop that 
are you going to ask the farmer to go out there and play with the dog or are we going to do a differential reinforcement strategy where the owner's going to or the farmer's going to reinforce the dog for alternative behaviors like what's the positive reinforcement strategy there it's not going to be counter conditioning because the dog's not afraid of the sheep so we're not changing underlying negative emotions there so and the reason i'm citing this case is it's a case i actually used in e-collaron probably about 10 years ago going on now but and it's kind of the last time i've had to use one but i still haven't come up with a strategy in a positive reinforcement based paradigm where it's not a, a management or getting rid of the dog. Right. Cause that was what the farmer told me. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to kill this dog actually. Right. right. With, Cause it's a utility. So again, just for the listener's sake, this is not a pet dog. And that's a quite normal concept for a livestock guardian dog in many farms. Although some of them are pets as well. So they of course care about the dog, but this cat, this case, this dog was just like a utility, uh, a tool. So what do you do there? Right. What's your options? You can the dog's going to be put to death by the farmer or maybe returned to the breeder if that's an option. Or what, what's our positive reinforcement strategy? I can't think of one. So sort of long winded answer to your to your question. But that's where the uh, positive of that tool in that particular case could be. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's critical thought there. And uh, and it's something I've talked to many other trainers about that. But no one's able to ever come up with a positive solution other than management. Like we'll, we'll muzzle the dog, but that doesn't take, that doesn't equip it to keep the coyotes away. Uh, manage the dog. Well, that doesn't keep it equipped to keep the coyotes away. Um, get the farmer out there, do some training. Well, that's not what the farmer wants to do. And it doesn't make sense because the guardian dog is going to be out there 24 seven protecting that flock. So, um, so maybe throw it back at you. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe you give me the, the negative in that scenario, if there is one. Um, oh, there is a lot of negatives, a lot of negatives. Um, I, I, I was just going to add to this one because I have mm-hmm. a very, very interesting case of a dog that was going to be put down in Miami and I took her. It was found on the street, like an extreme OCD case, like extreme. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have some videos for anybody that wants to see them on, on, on YouTube. Um, like she, like in my training area, she would start to lick the floor, but it's not licking, it's actually just dragging her tongue. And when I first got her, it was evaluation time. And I, I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna film and see, see where we go with this. Mm-hmm. Probably 50 minutes. And finally I was like, I have to stop the poor thing because this is just not right. Like she, she could not stop. Then I took her in the house and she was chasing shadows. It was just like, like an extreme, extreme, extreme case. Like um, I took her to a very well-known uh, uh, behavior specialist here, and which I actually way back in the 90s went to uh, Cornell to do a, a, like a summer aggression. Uh, they, they used to have this kind of uh, camps and and she was one of the presenters on psychotropic meds and it's like mm-hmm. very very like top and sh- and she was like you know this is for sure in my top five not in any order but in my top five in my all experience and I I was you know I I didn't know where I want to go with it. I just want the dog to, to see if we can help the dog or, or euthanasia is the right thing to do because it, it was it was not like, I will send you links and I'll, I'll post the links. And it, it's very, very heartbreaking to watch. Um, <coughs> for a very long time. Well, so it, it, there was the choice. Do we go mm-hmm. psychotropic medications? And I have a, I, I'm, I have a little bit of, um, you know, they have place in certain cases, but I think um, I think in a lot of cases they're they're uh, very easily prescribed, very um, you know, kind of rushed without uh, like veterinarians sometimes, and and I know they're doing their best to do the best thing that they can for the dogs. But I sometimes I feel it's pushed uh, a little mm-hmm. bit too fast and too soon before some behavior modification or with some combination of 
Um, long story short, I we 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 started her, and and of course, you know, you know well there is there is quite a few side effects of psychotropic medications. So, you know, like loss of appetite and and just kind of getting a little zombie-like and so on, but depending you know you have to play with the doses and never it's it's just a you know it's it's not an easy thing and and a lot of times it's successful i ended up like that dog and this is i i still have the dog with me right now um we we had to do a lot of interesting things i i had to go very deep in in all of my knowledge that i have and and look for help everywhere i really like bottom line i wanted to help the dog um she could not play but she would chase cars she would attack dogs she would lick floor she would chase shadows she Mm. she would not she has she would exhaust herself to the max and then she will drop to sleep and she will wake up ready to go right away again You, you i'm sure you you know dogs like this but this this was a very very extreme case and i spent a lot of time so it's been six months now and she turned around but it was play and it was electric collar and it wasn't an electric collar in terms of like hammering her and suppressing but enough to just stop that thought process to where she could be like what else do I do um, and we're at the point now that you know you, you you would tell that she's an active dog but you would never ever tell that she she had these issues mm-hmm. um, and and this kind of cases you know even though there's some individual separate cases they I think they teach us that we, we need to stay open-minded and and pick and choose the battles and and see what is the best and if that was not working out i i certainly would have went back to psychotropic medication or we would have euthanized the dog because like again i i don't think sometimes it's it's just the right thing to do as sad as it is um um but on on the on the bad side of electric color it's very easy to use like you you become what people call it very trigger happy it's like oh it worked for this so let's do it for this and 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 And that's a big problem another problem is that we are not looking to change perception we are focusing just kind of how we debated the clicker and and focusing on behavior electric color automatically forces you to suppress or use it as a negative reinforcement to where you're asking things that are not possible for the dog and you continue to demand believing that uh, they're going to become resilient to it and and Mm -hmm. it's going to be some miracle and ultimately you have a a awful picture to look at yeah to where you you really need to take that color away from that person um, but even when this happens, the problem is that that person, and we see them all the time in social media, they would use baseball bats and, and flip the dogs yeah. and throw, you know, on the floor. And, and like most of the most horrific things that lately come out on, on social media, abusing, they're not with electric color. And this is my fear that when we take electric color away, it can... We, we are not changing people's perception, how we're talking about changing dog's perception. We're mm-hmm. not teaching them how to be better. We're just taking one tool and they resort to something that actually, it's far more damaging um, or, or equally damaging. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, we don't solve the problem. It just makes us feel good. But the trigger happy, suppressing, 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 and demanding for a dog that there is a big sale on the electric collar that 
if we teach it, if we condition it, and if we show it, then they become yeah. resilient and they become very strong instead of breaking down. And I have a huge problem with that. Yeah. To where, um, um, like, like I, I probably am more upset and more angry than, than the force free community about certain uh, approaches in dog training with using electric color. Um, the idea again of anything that we do with dog training is to to not be able to tell what you've done it's like you have a very outgoing happy enjoyable dog around but again even when i'm saying these words they are used so much and then you see 30 seconds of a video and you're like no that's not the dog you're describing <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it yeah. breaks my heart watching that yeah. video and listening to you because it just doesn't come together um and somehow the suppression and the belief that we can fix anything with electric yeah. color is a big problem yeah a big problem but there's an again, addiction there can be an addiction factor to it because it's a quick fix right yeah. you see something so put something in somebody's hand whether it's the bat or the e-collar and, the, and then they have a punishment paradigm that they're gonna gonna reach for punishment because it's a quick fix in their yeah. mind it looks like and it works now now on the yeah. other side i i also with the quick fix i actually think quick fix is not a bad thing if we can yeah. if we can. if it's truly fixed but oh, it's not yes, exactly. problem is, is especially exactly. in aggression cases it's not truly fixed I right think, it's... i think we need to change we need to come up with a better yeah. uh, uh definition of this quick fix is not a it doesn't serve the purpose because I'm yeah, all about yeah. yeah i'm point. all about quick fix <laughs> yeah but yeah but it was that but not yeah, to sacrifice the the mental state or physical state yeah. of the dog if we can quickly fix something yeah why are we wasting time we need um, a bet we need a new term for we it definitely need a new term <laughs> hmm. <laughs> i usually have good i usually have good uh, analogies for this one. i'm coming up blank on this one like a different term for it instead of fix we got we got a quick uh suppression or or quick so, something catchy but yeah, but it makes sense though. It doesn't. It is not a quick fix most of the time. It's it just quick. Uh, it looks good on paper. Yeah, so. yeah. It, there's gotta. We need to come up just like with the reactivity stuff. It's just so much. Well, yeah. reactivity, mm -hmm. so vague. Right. A and then we when and then we are already. We have a very extremely vague definition, and now we are prescribing what we're gonna do. Ouch. Yeah yeah <laughs> um, but no i i um you know as much as i'm for electric color i'm v just as much against um as i say many like in in this other side of dog training i have a lot of enemies if you want to put it that way <laughs> simply because i'm you know just because i use electric color and you use electric color we are absolutely not the same we we don't even look at dogs the same way yeah yeah um it's... but it's a there is a reason why electric started to be used in research it was um It's just the way it works, you know. It 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 can trigger the brain to go fuck, panic, but actually, when done right, nothing happens besides you get the that whoa, and then we move on to all the good things that we can do. Um, I, yeah, it's a it's an interesting conversation. Maybe maybe we do that someday in person. It can be very interesting too. Mm. It's a much deeper thing, I think, to, to talk about that one. But um, the option back in the day, it was what you 
you hit them, you poke them, you air puff them, and you break their wings, you broke their legs, you blind them in all the experiments. And just for the experiment's sake, because that was a long time ago, nobody cared that much about the, the whatever the animal was in the box. But they wanted to make the studies, so they came up, okay, we need to, on one side, we need to make sure that we have something that can be replicated. So if we say that we are using that kind of level of intensity of aversive, then that's what we are using. Um, yep. But then they, they have to be able to, you know, and and one one of the, the most beautiful things is when it's not overused, and this is a must emphasize explicitly that it cannot be overused. Uh, we can, you know, very easy stop some some nasty, dangerous problems, and then add on top differential reinforcement, and then attach different emotion and purpose in a different direction. Um, and it speeds up the process, and this is why I'm talking that quick fix is a, you know, it's an interesting. Yeah, it, uh, it has to be. Kinda. It has to be defined correctly. What do you mean by that? For sure, when you bring that into a conversation, because it it could easily be a validation for somebody. One of the one yeah. of the problems with any aversive is the the argument most most um, force free trainers would have, and and you might be also, is that you you put it on yourself and you say, well that hurts but that really doesn't tell you anything because it depends on the the motivation of the dog it depends on the genetic position of course because sometimes you, you just are going against genetic makeup and certain things you, you you're just very stupid mm -hmm. and and cruel to try to change and suppress yeah but if you park your car in the wrong place, you may get a warning. And that might be plenty for you. Or you can get a ticket, or you can get your license suspended for a week, or for a year, or, but it reaches the level that it's needed to control your behavior. Yeah. And sometimes, reaching that level is unethical exactly it should not go there yeah. but yeah. that's education that's that's yeah. where i have huge problems with them yeah yeah because you can you can see it you're you're been doing it for a long time you're able to read what the dog is communicating to you and how they feel about it and so that yeah i agree that that uh, you know that and that example i guess of somebody putting a collar on their neck or something logo and it hurts this much I'm sure it hurts to that person at that moment. Sure. But what about the dog? The dog's going to tell you. And the same thing can happen with food, right? And the dog's going to tell you, oh, this food's great or not, or this is working for me here or not, based on their behavior and body language. That should always be our barometer's data. What's the dog telling us? You know, and, um, you know, like, but of course, with the versus, you know, as we were mentioning earlier, that it's the, the issue is the, the potential for the associations 100%. that can be created negatively, which we won't know until we know how to look at what we're seeing rather than just saying it's a blanket. This is always going to be this way, or it's always going, this food is always going to be reinforcing or e-collars are always going to be bad for the dog. Right. And that's unfortunately taken out the critical thought. The measurement is what the dog tells us. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, again, it's not to say I'm saying, oh, I'm suddenly an ecology trainer. It's not that at all. I just, I want to put some critical thought into this conversation. That way we can have these conversations, folks like you and I right. understanding more and having, and educating others about understanding, you know, where you're coming from. You know, it doesn't say I have to go out and use those tools, but it doesn't say you have to do anything you, you know, cause you, you're using them in a way that as it's from your background, it's from your education of seeing these things, you're able to, to have this conversation intelligently where those blanket statements do not right, put in right. any, any kind of conversation to it. It's just, it stops the conversation right there when you're doing that stuff, you know, when you're showing these examples, so to speak, of how a tool works. It shows actually a, a gross misunderstanding sometimes. And I'm not, a, I, I really, I don't, I, when I, and of course it's very subjective looking at yourself, you know, like you have 
your false idea of who you are and whatever but uh, mm-hmm. i i i don't see myself i don't think of myself as an electric collar trainer mm-hmm. i look at things as if i if i need it i still will is there a better way what is the better way how is it better mm-hmm. yes there is a better way boom it's it's comes naturally very easy and probably for the most part i wouldn't jump on an electric collar it's not a, a one, one of the things that i always say and I, I one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people don't like what i say about electric collars because i kind of go against the the some of the the norm of what it is right now accepted what somebody the level the amount of electric color used in one session regardless of what level it's used mm-hmm. i probably would use it in in six months and that's like if we have a you know some click counter of how many times yeah. they do it in one session it's uncalled for there is no like we we have to understand we need to try to make the dog want to do things because they want to do things create Mm -hmm. that in a dog don't otherwise it's a yeah it's some form of slavery it's it's just not right there is no even even if you do it right it's still you're not making the dog you're not becoming creative how do i make the dog want to do this with me versus no i have this thing that i'm gonna just make him do it yeah yeah it's so easy would you say you've in your growth or or your through your journey would you say you've used them more in uh over the years and, and since since their evolution they actually mm-hmm. probably haven't been around for 40 years or at least the modern collars um would you say you've used them more less or about the same right it, just my own curiosity in terms yeah, yeah. of you know the no, the, no. the this the, is good because just as i have questions you should you know it's perfectly cool that's that's what's about so i i have um i i remember my very first days of it it was in belgium and it was it's called teletalk and it, it looked like some james bond like <laughs> freaking like yeah bond, like this cubes on the dog's neck and they're yeah. like oh we're gonna do this to your dog and i'm like can we do something else it's like no no this is how we do and luckily like they were trying to set up my dog <laughs> so they can teach it a lesson right and for whatever reason my dog decided that he's gonna be good so he didn't <laughs> get it man what a relief that was yeah like this that i i rem- this was when we were talking 89 1989 and i remember it by minute how it went down um as you said things changed and i my 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 current approach is and this is probably a, a difference in how lima or i don't know how i think there is a new name now in the force free it's not lima i can remember now what but you know when we're talking about uh, list aversive, uh, minimally, you know, um, I, I, my, my thing is, if I know, like let let's pick a human analogy, if you are having pneumonia, and I, we know, like we, you go to a doctor, you have mm-hmm. a pneumonia, and you're getting over the counter medicines, and you're doing all holistic stuff, and you're you're about to check out and die when you actually should be on a certain treatment and we know that that treatment is gonna help immediately i think it's very unethical at that point to go that ladder when we know Mm -hmm. when we know yeah that this is not the case like you you play soccer and you hit some rock barefoot and i'm talking europe now being a kid and your feet are bleeding and you get some infection and next thing you know you have a gangrena and it's like yeah they need to take your foot they need to amputate your foot because what is the other option um 
but this should not be taken lightly and it takes experience takes education and 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 this is yeah. where it gets very difficult very difficult yeah but I and that's the operative words yeah education and experience to yeah. know that right. but i don't i don't agree with either situation because like mm. if we do it carelessly it's absolutely wrong yeah. and if we are taking time with a behavior that we know that we can stop so we can help us to start our differential reinforcement and 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 the whole program um but we are waiting we're actually making that behavior more stubborn and ultimately we don't even know where we are headed yeah i don't know this is just thoughts yeah and and you know it's a it's a it's a um, i don't want to say controversial but it is a debatable topic still right. even in the force free community this does so lima least intrusive minimally aversive that actually originated from stephen Lindsay. yes in his in his works in the applied handbooks and um it evolved and changed uh still with the same acronym i think it's an important uh tool for especially new trainers to think before do mm -hmm. because as you know regardless of which methodology or which camp they're in they should be thinking about what they're doing first. And I think it's a useful tool there. I think you have it also a valid argument though, that once you become experienced and you have 40 years behind you of training, you don't need to kind of, your thought process is already solidified. You don't need to be like, Ooh, am I, am I following the right product? Do I know how to use this technique properly? Of course you do. You've been doing it a long time, but somebody that's new been training a year, they need this framework. They really, it's, they need some guidance on what to do because if you look at any other profession or career where 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 there's this much going on with our our protocols and strategies we're putting in place with a, a living being there's a big amount of education so if we were talking going back to the doctor analogy if we were both doctors for instance we'd have a level of education where all of the terminology is going to be flowing back and forth and we're going to agree upon the same thing because that's what they teach in medical school dog trainers though a lot of them haven't gone to any school or they do go to school. Maybe it's a different school and the terminology, the language being used is differently. So the conversations can be very different, especially when it comes to um, making choices about the protocols and strategies we're putting in place to a dog, depending on the, the, the level of aversiveness or not. And that's where I think an important framework is beneficial to our industry to help the trainers understand, you know, Hey, think twice about what you're going to do before you do it to a dog, because it can impact, you know, everybody. So, yeah. Uh, so I agree with Lima. I do think though, it's still, there's some debate about no, no, it's dangerous. And where and, no, yeah. we cannot, yeah. I cannot say that it's not dangerous. Like it, it, it yeah. is definitely, but again, we, we cannot throw the babies with the water. I think we need to talk. I think we need to talk and we need yeah. to get better. It's, it's the best way. Yeah. It really is the best way. Yeah, that Lima definitely needs to be talked about and hashed out between the two communities as well because uh, a lot of the, you know, arguments are like, oh, look at the balance trainers now You saying, oh, yeah, this is their excuse to use aversives or, you know, and right. then... Vice versa, it's like they, 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 you know, it's oh, it's a force free like thing that they are saying now. This is their way of getting tools banned, and so there's a lot of false arguments, unfortunately, in this conversation. But that's uh, again what happens when something, well, an old concept talking. becomes new again. I guess you, if you were going to put it in a way, it's it's an I old think, concept, but it's it's. it's I think kind that's of what happens again. when we are not talking. When we are, we are just. Yeah go growing apart that's yeah that's the, yeah the issue. yeah so yeah it's it's definitely something it's a useful tool it has it should be talked about more i think it's going to be impactful but it, the uh the misconceptions around it are unfortunately clouding the usefulness of it so you know Michael, there's i just got a sign from eric that we have like two minutes left on memory cards like we've been oh, okay all right so yeah wow like, I'm so, I, I, totally I, I think I, I don't know if I hold the record amount of time but I, I really I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation so uh, I, I, appreciate I cannot your thank time. you enough I don't know I don't know how much you like this I love this conversation yeah, right now yeah uh, I, like, I, I, totally I very much to be able enjoy to talk to yeah, somebody yeah yeah um I, ho I hope we, we do again, and I, I actually hope that we actually do meet in person and 
to some training and whatever you know yeah like um yeah. It, it can be very cool um i'm gonna we, we're gonna list every all, all of the things and i hopefully it created some interest to my audience and and they look up and look yeah. you up and and uh, you know there, there is there is things to be learned there is yeah. definitely things to be learned dog training you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't stop it's yeah. it's just how it is i think that a good take-home message is just hey just talk to people you know right. get get out from behind that keyboard and, and just have a conversation you'll be surprised what you learn about people you know man thank you for accepting yeah. the the invitation and again like one of my best conversations um you know with somebody that may not agree on everything but actually open to to talk about things you know that's yeah. like yeah. i i love this this is this is what it's about yeah so Definitely. um yeah thank you my pleasure thank you thank you for the opportunity i'll, I'll so. be in touch uh okay we will do something all right looking forward to it for all sure right, michael take care all right ivan take care